Tranquility, majesty, peace through understanding of that giant old river running through my hometown. Standing on the bank, lost in the distance, imagining the future with the past flowing down. Can you see her in the light of a bright spring morning? Is she hidden in the shadows of warm October's past? Is the moonlight on the water reflecting your passion? What are we going to do to make it last? Wrap your loving arms around the heart of that river. Pass along our stories that you've heard for so long. Take a stand from Mother Nature and her hypnotizing waters. Sing that river song. Can you see her in the light of a bright spring morning? Is she hidden in the shadows of warm October's past? Is the moonlight on the water reflecting your passion? What we gonna do to make it last? Tranquility, majesty, peace through understanding of that giant old river running through my hometown. Standing on the bank, lost in the distance, imagining the future with the past flowing down. Imagining the future with the past flowing down. Imagining the future with the past flowing down. Welcome to the Sun Foundation's virtual clean water celebration. We are so excited to have you here along the banks of the Illinois River. Today, we are launching a new version of our interactive platform that includes some really fun games that you can play, some really wonderful video, and a chance for you to become a clean water champion. Our first video in the series that ties to one of the games is Dr. Jost from Bradley University. Watch closely. My favorite moment is some of her students actually came to the Clean Water Celebration when they were young, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, and now they're working on a degree in environmental sciences. We are here to inspire you to take action. This video will give you some ideas on how you can be a clean water champion. Hi, I'm Dr. Jennifer Jost from Bradley University's biology department, and today I'm looking at zebra mussels which are an invasive invertebrate. That means that they're not native to Illinois, they've been introduced. And part of their invasive nature is that they spread really rapidly. And throughout the Illinois waterways, they're causing massive economic and ecological, which means habitat damage by attaching to hard substrates, clogging pipes, and harming the native species that were already living here when they arrived. The best thing that you can do to prevent the spread of them is to make sure that anytime you pull a hard surface, like a boat or a boat propeller out of the water, you clean it thoroughly to be sure you're not spreading these to the next habitat that you take that boat. They also can attach to native species. So the native mussels are fairly large. They have a nice hard shell. That shell serves as a great place for these invaders to also attach. And that can be really detrimental to the native species. It makes it hard for them to feed and to grow. Even though the mussels are really small, like they can take out a lot of food from the ecosystem. And the way ecosystems are structured, they're like in food webs. So if you take away the phytoplankton, you're gonna hurt the things that eat the phytoplankton and the things that eat those and the things that eat those. You can disrupt the whole ecosystem. Actually a fun fact, as a middle schooler, I went to the uh, clean water celebration. So it's really cool that I'm uh, giving back to the community by studying our invasive species here in Illinois, especially in Peoria. One experiment we're doing right now is we're going to put our zebra mussels into an aerial exposure, we're basically putting them in different humidity and seeing how they'll last when they're outside the water. For example, if you have zebra mussels that are attached to your boat, for example, and you take it home, and then the next day you bring back your boat to a different lake 
or a different river, are those zebra mussels that might be attached, are their offspring that might be attached, are they going to make it their way into the other source of water and invade there? And so we're trying to examine what the conditions are and how they are impacted physiologically and see how they react to it. With all the videos that we're showing you this morning, we've greatly edited down a, a short version to put within the virtual platform designed by Interactiva. You can go to the Sun Foundation's YouTube channel and you can watch a longer version of the video that gives you a lot more detail, a lot more information and inspiration so you can become a clean water champion. But this next one is one of my favorite. Dr. Icy Cold Water, like a uh, 1800s medicine show, teaches us some of the basic physics of water. Good morning, folks. I am Dr. Icy Cold Water, and I am here to tell you about my mystical hydration formula. This formula is rare in the universe. This formula comes from the unique blue planet, and it is capable of cooling large land mammals, leveling large landscapes, acts as a special property when used in chemistry. It is a unique and absolutely essential property and it's something that you absolutely have to have. You can't do without my mystical hydration formula. This is dihydrogen monoxide. Yes, I said dihydrogen monoxide. And this dihydrogen monoxide is, well, water you do want water, yes? And you want clean water, yes? So this is a meter stick. Everything is measured out according to a meter and say this is like, you know, 100 centimeters, right? So measuring out the centimeters, I have 97% of all the water in the world is in the oceans, it's salt water. And we have 2.4 in ice, locked in ice and frozen properties and uh, 0.6, which is in processes, which means that out of all this water, only the red end of the stick is all the fresh water you will ever see or use in your lifetime. My guess is you probably have never seen an 1850s or 1880s medicine show like Dr. Icy Cold Water. But wasn't that great fun? And I, as a, as a science teacher, learned something about the physics of water. Do check out the longer video. But when you enter the game platform, one of the really cool things is there's like a, a treasure hunt, a little bit like an Easter egg hunt. There's some duck stamps you look for. And if you get a good set of them, you can learn a lot about ducks, duck migration, and duck hunting. Shea Berkey and his son helped us with this wonderful documentary about the history of hunting and how duck hunters were some of our first conservationists. But Shea Berkey says it best. Hello everyone, my name is Shea Berkey, and I've been hunting since I was 11 years old. My love for hunting actually started with a love for the outdoors and for animals. I know that sounds contradictory, but believe it or not, hunters provide the greatest source of revenue for wildlife management here in the United States and in many other countries as well. To many hunters, hunting is as much about connecting with nature as it is about harvesting. It's about being outdoors, spending time with families, exercising, honoring our history and traditions, providing needed wildlife population control and funding for wildlife management through license and equipment sales. Given that we are likely to continue the trend of more people living here on Earth, do you think it's important to have areas that we protect and use wisely with forethought to the future? My hope is that you are now starting to wonder how you can get involved in conservation. It's really quite easy. First, join a conservation group like Ducks Unlimited, or The Nature Conservancy. You can also contribute directly through taking a hunter education course, a learn to hunt course, buying your very own hunting and fishing licenses to represent responsible hunters the world over. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation today, and I'd like to leave you with a quote from Aldo Leopold himself for you to ponder. We shall hardly relinquish the shovel, which after all has many good points, but we are in need of gentler and more objective criteria for its successful use. 
I grew up in a family that loves to hunt and fish. And I learned early on that actually duck hunters in particular are important in the history of conservation. And that hunters and fishermen understood that we need to conserve the habitat. We need to conserve the resources. And honestly, what's good as far as habitat for ducks is good for a great variety of birds. They use these rivers for migration. There's another really fun game where you can help birds succeed in their migration. As a matter of fact, standing here on the river, I found the tip, I believe it's a, a right primary wing feather from a white pelican. They have pure white wings with just a little bit of black on the very tip. I must also tell you, it's against the law for you to collect feathers from wild birds unless you have the right scientific permit. You can pick it up and look at it, but you have to give it back to nature where it belongs. Let's follow some birds. Travis Wilcox is an amazing ornithologist who has been catching and banding birds for, for decades and collecting data to help us learn more about migration. Within the game, there's a really fun game where you can learn about how eagles and, uh, and hummingbirds and ducks migrate. Hi, I'm Dr. Travis Wilcoxon and I am the Chair of the Biology Department and an Associate Professor of Biology at Millican University. And my area of research expertise is wildlife health. And most of my research with wild animals actually involves birds. And when you think about the importance of resources for birds, I think many times we think about food. And people spend a lot of time and a lot of money on feeding birds and trying to make sure they have the right blend to attract the right bird species. And in most cases, they're also hoping that what they're putting out there is actually good for the birds and is actually helping them with their health. But to be honest, outside of maybe a bird bath once in a while uh, and, and a water source in your yard, I don't think people tend to think as much about the importance of water at, on, on a big scale for the health of birds. But water also provides for the other resources they need. Water provides for the trees, water provides for the plants and the habitats in which these birds reside. Water provides the nourishment for the seeds that these birds eat if they're not coming to your feeder. Water provides the nourishment for the insects that they eat as well. And so every time a bird is out there and it's pursuing some type of meal, there's water involved in the acquisition of that food. Promote the conservation of birds, promote science in local community organizations and to the general public. And if you are a voice for clean water, then you are also a voice for healthy birds. I do love bird watching and hanging out with Travis is always a great day. I love bird watching almost as much as I love fishing. And there's so much we can learn about the great web of life and our relationship within it from a fisherman. This next story is adapted from a book that I wrote called The Web at Dragonfly Pond. One day I was out fishing with my dad and the mosquitoes were eating us alive. Bzz, ah, ooh, ah, and there goes one with a pint of my blood. As soon as that mosquito flew away, out of nowhere came a dragonfly and ate the mosquito who had eaten me. Moments later, the dragonfly landed on a lily pad and a great big bullfrog whipped out its tongue and swallowed the dragonfly whole. Brr -rump, brr -rump. The frog lives in two worlds, swims in dark pools, and leaps about upon the land at dusk, singing to the moon, hoping another frog hears his song, but mostly singing because it feels good in his throat. When the frog began, splash, up came a large mouth bass. A huge fish swallowed the bullfrog, swam off to the bottom, resting and digesting. Just then, I cast my lure over there, and sure enough, oh, I got it! I reeled it in! It was the biggest largemouth bass I'd ever caught! And when I cut it open and I cleaned that fish, oh, inside its stomach, I found a bullfrog. And inside the bullfrog, I know it was dissolved, but I imagined a dragonfly. And inside the dragonfly, bzz, the mosquito who'd eaten me. As I ate that fish for dinner, I realized you, me, we are all part of the great web of life. One thing that impacts us every day, one impact you can have every day, are the three R's. I'm not talking about reading and writing and arithmetic. 
because that one starts with an A. <laughs> but reduce, reuse, recycle. One very important form of recycling is composting. We had the opportunity to go and visit one of the largest composting facilities in the Midwest. Our next mini documentary takes you there so you can see composting in action. And there's a really fun game where you can choose what things are recyclable, what things are compostable, and how can we make a difference? How can you be a clean water champion? What can we learn from better earth composting? So today we're at Better Earth to talk about how you can reduce your waste. How can you reduce your waste stream? How can you turn garbage into a useful material? And Paul Rosenbaum, who created Better Earth, is here to take us on a little tour. We've got all the municipalities around. We get their yard waste, which is grass, leaves, and brush. We bring them over here to our mixing pad and our grinding pad. We have that to mix in with our nitrogen sources, such as our food waste and our grass when it comes in. So within a week, you don't see anything once we get in the rows and the microbes start working on it. You won't see the bones, the fish head, or anything. It just breaks down quickly. From start to finish, it takes three months. It takes two months to roughly compost it down, then about a month of uh, curing what we call it, then it's ready to go in the bag. That is genuinely exciting to think that uh, trash turned to treasure, that old cliche, that your food waste from your school cafeteria can be turned into fertile soil to help grow next year's vegetables. Garbage to gold. From garbage <laughs> to gold. And it's black gold. We've got uh, five rows right there that are about halfway done. They've been uh, composting for a month. Landfill, it would take 30 years. Well, this is where the end product comes out at. This is our half inch screen compost. It's just nice and fine. It, it, it's ready to go, ready for the gardeners. Put it in the hole of the ground. To make a plant grow well, it's what's under the plant that makes the difference. So now it's time and look, they're coming through. Everybody's here to join us for this great day. We're launching a new version of the Sun Foundation's virtual clean water celebration. Thanks to Interactiva, uh, we have this wonderful platform where you can go for a walk through this virtual reality and you can play some really great games. There's a treasure hunt, you're looking for duck stamps, you can learn about recycling, help birds migrate, and learn about the food web and our role within it with the various trophic levels. <laughs> and hopefully by playing these games and watching these videos, there's dozens of more videos, you will be inspired so you too can become a clean water champion. Tranquility, majesty, peace through understanding of that giant old river running through my hometown standing on the bank lost in the distance imagining the future with the past flowing down can you see her in the light of a bright spring morning is she hidden in the shadows of warm october's past is the moonlight on the water reflecting your passion Thank you to all of our sponsors and to you for stepping up to make this possible. Good morning. We are so glad that you're here. This is going to be an exciting day. We couldn't have found better weather. We're at Forest Park Nature Center. The river's just beyond those trees. You have to believe me on that one. And uh, uh, we're going to have several live guests in the studio. We uh, decided not to have any dead guests. <laughs> They're not as much fun. Um, and we're going to be showing videos throughout the morning. Um, Today is the day of the virtual clean water celebration uh, from the Sun Foundation. I want to again echo a gratitude to all of our sponsors who make this happen. And uh, throughout the morning, we're going to alternate between uh, live uh, 
in studio guest <laughs> and uh, and running some of the great videos. Um, but it's also the launch of the new game platform. If you go to the Sun Foundation's website, you can watch all the videos. You can uh, log into the game and uh, and learn to be a clean water champion. We need you. We need every one of you to be a part of making a difference for not only the health of the environment, but the health of clean water. Now, one of our first guests here, our very first guest in studio, um, works for Illinois American Water, who has been one of our major sponsors throughout the long history. We're close to 30 years now. And uh, Trip Barton, uh, he just introduced himself to me as someone who's a nerd herder. I love that name. <laughs> so Trip, tell us a little bit about your job and what do you do for Illinois American Water? Sure, uh, good morning everybody. Uh, so I am an engineering manager with uh, Illinois American Water. Uh, we cover our, my area covers uh, pretty much like uh, Illinois River to Mississippi River, I-80 down to Springfield. But our, our company covers the whole state and our bigger company covers most of the United States. But our engineering group basically builds anything that's capital improvement wise. So like uh, water main replacements, water towers, uh, water treatment plants, and, and and the like. You were talking earlier about the UV uh, light uh, yeah. filtration. That's yeah. fascinating to yeah. me as a science geek. S Tell me how that works real briefly. Sure. Uh, so basically it's a tanning bed on steroids, and, that's, <laughs> and that takes care of it. No, so uh, basically there are viruses that are in water, especially on surface water, um, and to make those safe for the public, it goes through a UV system, and then it inactivates those viruses. So then it's safe to drink for the water. Uh, we also, on top of that, we still we still disinfect like we normally do. Uh, but the UV system offers uh, some options to use less chemicals uh, and then make a little bit of a safer option for folks. And you know, I, I'm drinking uh, Peoria water, which I, I know some of it comes from the river and some of it comes from groundwater, the San Cody Aquifer. Correct. And this is actually what a lot of people will put in a plastic bottle and sell for dollars a gallon. Sure. And you can get it for pennies a gallon and, and, and drink it yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Our, uh, actually, our well field is about half a mile away from here, yeah. uh, and then uh, the treatment plant's about two miles that way. So, yeah. no, uh, it comes, uh, depends upon where you're at, where the, the water comes from, uh, but most, most often it's a mixture between surface water, like a river or a lake, and then uh, groundwater through a well. So. So this next video we're about to watch is a tour of your facility with uh, one of your cohorts. Can you tell us a little bit about Pam and sure. this tour? Sure. Uh, Pam ingersoll Godi is uh, our water quality expert, and she uh, works at the main plant here. Uh, actually, she covers the same area that I do, actually even more so. And then, uh, but no, she is going to explain how the process works for treatment and specifically for surface water treatment. So the plant that we toured here uh, is our Illinois River plant in Peoria. Uh, long story short, she'll go through the uh, the processes, but there's an intake on the river. It goes through uh, filtration, uh, settling, uh, UV, and then also uh, you know final disinfection before it goes out to the system. But it's a pretty interesting process. It's been that plant's been there for uh, a long time, and uh, the process gets improved over time, um, but the, the guts are the same, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was really cool because the, in the in the museum there, you actually see hollow logs that were used as the original yeah. pipes. Now they're much better. Yeah, right, and, right. Uh, and the filtration, there's, there's actually elements of the old filtration system, but the new filtration was pretty mind-boggling to be able to walk through and see how many gallons they filter. Yeah. Um, our first video today, all of our videos are virtual field trips. So if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do that um, because then you can go and see, uh, you can take your class uh, throughout the country. We have videos from all over, but this first one was filmed locally, literally uh, just down the road from here. And it is a tour of Illinois American water, much like your water filtration plant wherever you live. Let's go. Hi there, and welcome to Illinois American Water. My name is Pam Godey, and I am one of the water quality leads here for Illinois. I'd like to welcome you today to take a tour of our treatment facility and learn how we bring the river to your tap. Where we're standing right now is the original treatment plant facility when we originally just used groundwater. It was built around 1890 with the Romanesque idea. On each corner, facing both or all north, south, east, and west is a gargoyle. So currently, this building is used as a museum. We have several archives in there of the old way of treatment, old testing ideas, and even old water mains made out of wood. Here in the Peoria district, the customers are supplied 
with approximately 20 million gallons a day of water. That water comes from four major plants in the Peoria district. We have the river plant uh, here down on the Illinois River, and then we have three other just groundwater plants. The focus today is gonna to be the treatment on the river plant because compared to groundwater sources, there's a lot more treatment that's needed to clean up that river water and make it safe drinking water. So when you're standing at the Illinois River here at our treatment plant, from this plant directly, we average about 10 million gallons of treated water a day going to our customers out of here. Seems like a lot, but as you stand there on the river, approximately 10 million gallons flows by every 10 seconds. So a drop out of that river is what we are treating here today. Taking you through the process of our treatment, this is a little micro scale of how we do that. So our first step in the treatment process obviously is grabbing the raw river straight from the Illinois River. As you can see, it doesn't look so appetizing. It's got a little bit of dirt and sediment and what we call turbidity. Turbidity, a quick definition of that is how well can you see through it? So as I look down in this river, I'm looking down, I'm looking through, the light is not shining through the best. Luckily, here on the Illinois River, we don't encounter a lot of industrial contaminants and waste. Our primary issue here is uh, soil erosion, creating this higher uh, turbidity, basically caused by dirt. So our first step right out of the river to help clean up that river water is to remove those dirt particles. That process is called flocculation. In flocculation, we actually add a chemical, fancy name called um, aluminum chlorohydrate polymer blend. And it's just a fancy word for a chemical that makes those negatively charged dirt particles want to stick together and party together. When we add that flocculation chemical, we stir it, get that all mixed up so it can contact as much dirt particles as possible. From there, we send it to the sedimentation basin. And in the sedimentation basin, you can see, basically we just stop stirring it. And we let all that dirt that has been, uh, become larger, heavier, we let it sink to the bottom of these huge basins. Each of those sedimentation basins are approximately 2.1 million gallons. What we do next is we take that clear part of water off the top, the name for that is a supernatant, and that water itself is piped over to large filtration devices that we have. What we have at this river plant is called gravimetric filters, and they are GAC filters, granular activated carbon. So that clear part of the water can come off and goes through our filters. We have seven large filters about the size of what, you know, you would say like a large hotel um, swimming pool. And, but there are a couple stories deep. And what they consist of is a little example here. They consist of about 30 inches of carbon, that granular activated carbon on top. And the filter bed itself consists of various sizes of sand, gravel, rock, and stone. And what that does is gives us the final level of filtration. As you can see, the river, dirty, it can start at a turbidity unit, anywhere from five turbidity units to 200. The flocculation and sedimentation process brings that level of river turbidity, no matter what level, down to below a one turbidity unit and that cleans it up pretty well, but again, we need to do a little bit more final so that our turbidity is below a 0 0.3 turbidity unit. And this filtration and those filters I spoke about is how we achieve that final compliance. The granular activated carbon on top also serves another purpose. It gets rid of taste, odors, contaminants that might be coming down the river, some bacteria, a little bit of viruses, and it does that because it's cap capturing the last part of the dirt particles that could be holding those viruses and bacteria. And now that we're out of that filtration process, we do have our final water here, which you can see compared to the river is very clear, very low detectable turbidity. Um, 
We know now that we are, have achieved our turbidity compliance, but it's not quite safe to drink. We still need to add a disinfectant to ensure that all viruses and bacteria are not in that water. So before we add our disinfectant of chlorine, because this is a surface water, we need to put it through our UV, or ultraviolet light, reactors. What those reactors do is they take the DNA of the viruses and they damage it. And by damaging the DNA on those viruses, it does not allow the viruses to reproduce in a host. In this case, the host would be us humans and make us sick. Um, the UV is great. It gets rid of those viruses, but the problem is it is not a disinfectant that will stay from the plant to your home. So what we do from there is we add a chemical called chlorine. Here in Peoria, we add what's called combined chlorine. Another term for that is chloramines. And what that does is chlorine by itself kind of wants to party with other things. The term for that is volatile. So it wants to go out, hang out with other people. So it goes away pretty fast. In order to keep that chlorine stable and not wanting to go out and party so much and get out of the water, it actually, we combine it with just a little bit of ammonia that stabilizes the chlorine, makes it happy, and it keeps that chlorine in the water further and further distances out into our system so that it stays in the water all the way to your home. After that, um, we do have two more chemicals that we add. We add fluoride, and that is for, to help prevent uh, gum disease, cavities, tooth decay same type of concept that you would find in your toothpaste. And the last chemical we add um, is very important to prevent corrosion in the pipes. And that is a corrosion inhibitor that is also called an orthophosphate. That orthophosphate coats the pipes. It is our pipes that are, are transmitting the water to your home and your own internal plumbing. It helps prevent the metal leaching from those pipes into the water. So that is the final step of our treatment process here at the river plant. And you may think to yourself, okay, you've added all these chemicals. It's safe to drink. That's all you have to do. It is, but we can't just send it out and be like, oh, good luck, I hope it's safe. There is testing going on 24 seven at this treatment plant. We run dozens of tests a day hundreds of tests a week, thousands of tests a year, testing the treated water. From there, we also go out into our distribution system, so to different people's houses, different facilities, and we take water samples. This little gadget here is actually an analytical apparatus. It's something we can take out in the field with us, not being tied to um, an outlet or a big piece of machinery that we can't lug around. So even though it may seem like an endless resource, water is never an endless resource. What we encourage you to do, little things at home, turn the faucet off when you're brushing your teeth, um, you know, and drink a, a glass of water and you don't finish it. You realize it's still sitting there the next day. Don't pour it down the drain. Go put it on one of your plants outside instead. Important thing about watering flowers, encourage, you know, the use of rain barrels. That is a very important part of regenerating that naturally occurring water and putting it back into the ground. Um, another important part is planting native. Make sure that you are planting flowers and um, landscaping according to our, our Illinois um, climate so that you don't have to overwater flowers. They're used to our droughts, our floods, and all that. Uh, that's a crucial part of, of playing your part in the water treatment process. That is such a great tour. I really enjoyed traveling with them uh, inside the plant to see the, uh, the filtration process. And you can check out these videos anytime. They're all on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe. Um, our next guest is live in the field. Uh, Dr. Travis Wilcoxon has done a lot of work with the Sun Foundation. He's a professor at Millican, and he's been working with the Illinois Raptor Center. And when we say Raptor, I hope you know that uh, raptors are velociraptors and cooper hawks and eagles and owls. And they were just on CBS National News because of their research 
on um, lead in the environment. But this morning, uh, Travis is out there catching and banding birds. Good morning, Travis. How you doing? <laughs> and you got something for us. What do you have? We do. Had uh, a successful morning so far. We have uh, seven nets set up around the 25-acre property here next to the Sangamon River in Decatur. And uh, we're actually going to start today with our first capture, which is the Illinois State bird. Good start. So here in the bag. Any guesses why he's getting the bird out? Shout it out. What bird do you think it is? Illinois State bird. Actually, state bird is seven states, I think. Ooh. Oh, and he, uh, the, the Cardinal's just going to do the rest of this interview for us. <laughs> so this is a male Northern Cardinal, and he's not happy. Um, so we are banding birds today, so I'm even going to be able to, in this format, give you a quick look at the band here. Ooh. Which is a small metal band. It has nine numbers on it. Uh, unique to my lab, unique to my crew that will be banding birds, uh, and won't be given to any other bird anywhere else in the United States. Uh, so that if this bird is happened to, if happens to be found somewhere else, uh, we will get a return on this. They will they will let us know um, that our bird has been found somewhere else. And on this tiny band, there's even an 800 number to call to report it. Um, they put a lot of information on this tiny little piece of metal. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, today we're here with the clean water celebration. So part of the message, right, is, is why does clean water matter for birds? And you know, you might look at a cardinal and say, well. You know, cardinals aren't exactly spending a lot of time on the water, you know, like a duck, um, or, you know, in, in other animals like that, or a heron that's in the water. Um, but these animals obviously are going to rely upon, you know, clean water, groundwater that, that fuels the plants and the insects that eat the plants. And so if toxins are accumulating in the water, they're accumulating through the food chain and also going to find their way into birds like this. So even a cardinal is, is in need of clean water. Well, that was the thing that astounded me talking to your, your buddy Jack this weekend is how lead gets in the environment, gets in the birds, and then when the uh, raptors eat birds, it bioaccumulates. So, Travis, you and your team are doing groundbreaking research, and I really admire that. Um, and you're working a lot with your students as uh, interns in this research project. Tell me more about how students are involved. Correct. That, uh, that original lead project started with a student project. Um, we were able to get a grant. Um, the student was able to write successfully for a couple of grants to buy some lead testing equipment. Um, and we just grew it from there. Um, even on the project today, the blood samples we're taking um, will be used for students to see what kind of diseases this, these birds might be carrying that we're sampling today. Um, and really, you know, I'm the, the one with the professional background and the training, but I'm really just a coach. I like to, to let all of the students that follow um, that are interested in careers that involve animal health or wildlife give a chance to learn how this works. So while I'm the one on video today, um, when we drop in later, maybe we'll have Morgan over here doing something with the bird. Great. Go Milliken. <laughs> well, Travis was also one of our guests in one of our videos. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about, about the video to get our audience ready for it? So, um, in, in, we're at the Rapture Center today because we have this beautiful net array, but uh, you know, wherever we can set up this nets, we can catch birds. And so um, we had a video recorded uh, about rivers of birds uh, in my backyard, which is in northern North Decatur, um, in a nice little spot along Stevens Creek. And uh, I, I speak broadly in that video uh, more than just about songbirds, about why clean water matters for pretty much all of our feathered friends. Thank you. And, uh, and, and a shout out to the Illinois Raptor Center. I love the work that you guys are doing there with not just rehabbing birds so they can release them in the wild, which is your primary goal, but when you have those birds in hand, you can collect data, collect blood samples, and learn a lot more about the health of the big picture, the broader environment. And birds are more than just canary in a coal mine as a metaphor. They, they do teach us a lot about the health of our environment and health of water. Well, we'll check back in with Travis again in less than an hour, so stick around. Let's see what, what he catches in the next hour. But let's uh, see Travis's River of Birds. I think we're ready for that. Hi, I'm Dr. Travis Wilcoxon, and I am the chair of the biology department and an associate professor of biology at Millican University. And my area of research expertise is wildlife health. And most of my research with wild animals actually involves birds. And when you think about the importance of resources for birds, I think many times we think about food and people spend a lot of time and a lot of money on feeding birds and trying to make sure they have the right blend to attract the right bird species. And in most cases, they're also hoping that what they're putting out there is actually good for the birds and is actually helping them with their health. 
But to be honest, outside of maybe a bird bath once in a while uh, and, and a water source in your yard, I don't think people tend to think as much about the importance of water at, on, on a big scale for the health of birds. Uh, you don't necessarily see birds spending a lot of time drinking. Uh, and in fact, that's uh, part of the biology of birds. Many birds don't spend a lot of time drinking. They can sustain themselves just on the water that they produce from eating their food. But water also provides for the other resources they need. Water provides for the trees, water provides for the plants and the habitats in which these birds reside. Water provides the nourishment for the seeds that these birds eat if they're not coming to your feeder. Water provides the nourishment for the insects that they eat as well. And so every time a bird is out there and it's pursuing some type of meal, there's water involved in the acquisition of that food. Further, birds take migratory paths oftentimes from one area to another. Now we know we have resident birds that will stay in one place all year round. And for the most part, those are the ones that you see visiting your feeders the most. And yet there are still many, many species that will spend their winter in one place, their summer in another place, and they actually have to stop over other places in between. And if you look at major migratory paths for most of these species, what is the primary thing that they're following? The water. And we're here in central Illinois, and we are part of the Mississippi River Flyway. It is one of the major migratory paths for most bird species from the smallest of songbirds or the hummingbirds even, all the way up to large raptors that make long migrations. And the quality of that water is critical at all of those points along the way. The purpose of bird banding is to be able to track birds through those patterns of migration. So when they follow those uh, migratory pathways, we can keep track of how many of them are making it from one point to another, um, how many of them are surviving to the next year. And locally, it helps us understand, uh, in my research, the health of those birds because we can capture them one time and capture them later. We can look at the individual identifier band on that bird's leg and know exactly where that bird came from, exactly what condition it was in when we first caught it, and now we can compare that to how it's doing now. And that gives us a sense of how the bird populations are doing and how we're doing to protect those bird populations. And so in my research, we have spent a lot of time trying to get a better understanding of the health of the birds, again, from the effects of feeders, uh, from which we found that in general, when you feed birds, you are in fact helping them become healthier animals. Now, there are some exceptions. So for instance, if you don't clean your feeders, there can be a greater risk of disease. And we obviously don't want to be spreading disease at a place where we're trying to attract birds to our locations. Uh, some of those uh, diseases can also be spread specifically through the cleanliness of the bird bath. So again, back to the connection with water, uh, bird baths can be common places where salmonella uh, can accumulate. And so cleaning the bird bath once in a while is also important for the health of the birds. Other things that we found, out, found through um, our bird feeding research is that there are certain diseases that can be spread to birds that have nothing to do with your feeders, but the birds actually may have acquired a disease somewhere else say from a mosquito bite, and they're coming to your feeder to actually try to clear themselves of the infection, to try to increase their nutrition, their nutrition and to make themselves healthier. And so in a lot of ways, keeping feeders out there are helping birds, they're bringing birds close to you, they're helping you connect with nature, and uh, that's something that is really great for all of us who care about wildlife. So when we consider the protection of water sources, uh, it's not the same as, say, trying to make sure that the feeders uh, in your yard are well-maintained and, and clean and ready for the birds. When we consider large bodies of water like major rivers and lakes, it does take more than just one person's effort to make sure those stay clean. Uh, it does take uh, support of scientific research. It takes um, helping make sure that you get the word out that protecting that water source is important. Uh, we know that there are things like agricultural chemicals that are necessary in a lot of ways to try to feed the world, but we also want to try to make sure we can somehow mitigate their effects on water quality and the damaging effects on the environment and the animals that are there. One of the things that we also have studied is the effects of lead on birds, and specifically of birds of prey. And when we started to find lead poisoning in birds of prey, we thought to ourselves, okay, so maybe it's lead ammunition. And we quickly found that many birds that were showing up with lead poisoning were not actually scavengers. So they would not have eaten a deer pile that has lead shot in it. Um, like a cooper sock, for instance, might eat another small bird. So our next step was, well, what's going on with the prey? 
And one of our most interesting findings from that research is even in capturing small songbirds like house sparrows and European starlings that are common prey items for Cooper socks, we actually consistently found lead in their blood as well. And clearly they're not getting lead from consuming ammunition from hunters. So again, what is the likely source? Environmental sources unrelated to say hunting pressures and activities. And it's very possible that it has something to do with the environmental resources such as water quality, the quality of the habitat in which those animals live. And so when we consider our role, when we consider the way that all of these things are linked, we consider that the blade of grass that the bird is landing in or the seed that it's eating off the plant or the water that it's drinking from, any of those sources, if they're contaminated and they're not of high quality, can lead to negative health consequences for that species or for that animal. We need to make sure that we are always aware of the things that we do to, protect, to keep the water clean and to protect those animals. What can we do individually to help uh, protect the water that the birds rely on so much? Well, first, we can try to make sure that our impact on that water source is limited. So each individual person avoids throwing trash and disposing of um, hazardous waste in ways that are inappropriate. So don't dump things into water sources. Don't throw your trash into water sources. Um, maintain the uh, household waste products in proper ways that your local environmental organizations recommend. Um, promote the conservation of birds, promote science in local community organizations and to the general public. And if you are a voice for clean water, then you are also a voice for healthy birds. So we'll check back in with Travis in just a little while. Um, he's such a phenomenal person, and I love that he's training the next generation. You too can be a clean water champion, as he clearly is, and working with the Illinois Raptor Center, just doing really great work. Well, we have a special guest in the, I, I keep wanting to say in the studio, but we're outside at Forest Park Nature Center with these beautiful bluebells blooming behind us. And sitting beside me is one of my good friends uh, who will be providing some music. Since we just finished one bird video, we're going to another in a moment. Let's hear from Mr. Barry Cloyd and a song that he wrote about the American bald eagle. Valley rolling out below me. Random thoughts of people who have journeyed here before me in my head. Stories trigger memories of those travelers who have faded into history. And this ghostly wind so high above the Illinois whispers what they say. I am a man of the prairie. I am a woman of the buffalo. I'm a child of the mother. We are the people of the eagle, don't you know? Tales went rattling round of the days before the days were named and numbered. Spirits of the ancient ones appeared before my quiet astonished mind. And they spoke of a time when the people and their land were held in balance. And they left me with a song with a beacon in the dark for one so blind. child of the mother we are the people of the eagle don't you know in aji wabli hao ya te ji atakia ho in aji wabli hao ya te ji atakia ho Thank you, Barry. Uh, that is such a great song. It's one of many that he has written that I really love. We'll hear more from Barry later. Um, but while we're in the world of birds, there are a couple of junior high and high school students. I call them the McPhee 
cousins. It's actually John McPhee, Joseph Hyatt, and Charles Hyatt. And uh, it started as an Eagle project, a Boy Scout project, um, to clean up a neighborhood park. And then they started planting native flowers for the birds. Because if you plant native plants, it's better for the birds. And then they realized that what they were doing was creating a carbon sink uh, that has an impact on the climate. Then they wrote a grant and raised $10,000 and did Zoom programs during COVID to train other junior high and high school kids up and down the California coast. Literally from San Diego to San Francisco, they've done dozens and dozens of these projects. They are the epitome of clean water champions. Not only have they done this phenomenal work themselves, but they've been an inspiration to others, provided training, provided plant material to reverse climate change. You can do this project in your backyard, in your neighborhood. But let's go to uh, the mini climate makeovers along the California coast with the McPhee cousins. Birds are real. So is climate change. And so is your ability to help. In Earth's past, the climate changed slowly, giving plants and animals time to adapt. But today, as birds face habitat loss, food insecurity, and migration disruption, it's becoming harder and harder for these birds to adapt. It's almost as if the world is moving faster than they can catch up. That's why we created the Climate Mini Makeovers Project. We want to empower young people to pursue environmental justice in their own communities by teaching them how to perform mini makeovers in their yards, patios, balconies, and shared spaces. As young people act locally, they reduce their carbon footprint, create bird-friendly habitats, learn about the climate crisis, and become part of the solution. We help young people recognize and weed out invasive plant species and replace them with native ones. In order to survive, birds need the native species that they evolved with. The problem with the plants that are available in many nurseries is that they are exotic species that come from other places. The exact qualities that are extolled by the nurseries, such as having leaves that are resistant to to native insects and caterpillars are the same qualities that make them poor sources of food for native birds. It turns out that over 90% of North American bird species feeds insects to their young. So insect-proof plants might as well be artificial plants. Without insects, birds have nothing with which to nourish their young. This year we taught 60 middle schoolers in our community to make bird-friendly habitats in their own homes, winning us the Keep America Beautiful Hometown USA Award for Lasting Change. In accordance with safety guidelines, we dropped off the equipment at a community center beforehand and taught summer camp classes over Zoom to other youth in our city. Some of them live in single family homes with yards or gardens. Others live in apartments or duplexes with balconies. We've implemented principles that will work in any setting to plant bird friendly native plant species. It isn't enough to understand that we have a responsibility to them or to comprehend on a logical level that we cannot make it through life without them. It isn't even enough to feel that we should stop and help or that we will be glad later if we do stop and help. We actually have to do it. John James Audubon once said, quote, a true conservationist knows that the world is not given to him by his fathers, but borrowed from his children. We want a world that future generations can live in, one where they will appreciate the beauty of nature. Climate Mini Makeovers creates bird-friendly environments that provides food, saves water, and fights climate change. We connect people to the part of the Earth that they live in. As more and more people improve their immediate surroundings, the Earth will be turned into a patchwork of beautiful spaces. Please join us today by helping to improve your space. Thank you.
Well, that is one of my favorite student produced videos. If you are a student group and you're making a difference, you can produce your own video. You can do this. But more important, you have to do some really grand project about making a difference. So look around your local environment. Could you clean up a neighborhood park as they did? Are you concerned about bird migration routes as they are? Do you want to make a difference for climate change as they did? I mean, wherever you live, look around. There are very important projects that need to be done. And you can do these things. Um, I'm going to throw it back to Barry here for a little bit of a song. And then we have some more guests. And we have a special award we'd like to give them. Uh, but let's hear another tune from Barry Cloyd. When I was a child, my family would travel. So have a seat here. Down to western and, uh, Kentucky, where my parents were born. I'll, I'll sit on the and scoot over. There's a backwards old times often remembered. Who's this leaf? So many times that my memories won't. And Daddy, won't you take me back to Mutenburg County? Down by the Green River where paradise lay. Well, I'm sorry, my son, but you're too late to ask him. Mr. Peabody's coal train's haunted away. Well, sometimes we travel right down the Green River. The abandoned old risen down by Hadry Hill. Where the air smell like snakes and we shoot with our pistols. Yes, snakes really do smell. And empty pop bottles was all we could kill. And Daddy, won't you take me back to Muhlenberg County? Down by the Green River where paradise lay. Well, I'm sorry, my son, but you're too late to ask him. Mr. Peabody's coal train is haunted away. This goes out to John Prine, wherever he may be. When I die, let my ashes flow down the Green River. Let my soul roll on up to the Rochester Dam. And I know I'm in heaven, there's paradise waiting Just five miles away from wherever I am And Daddy, won't you take me back to Muhlenberg County Down by the Green River where paradise lay well, I'm sorry, my son, but you're too late Mr. Peabody's coal train is haunted away. Mr. Peabody's coal train is haunted away. Thank you, Barry Cloyd. You're uh, welcome, uh, and Brian Fox Ellis. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great song. Uh, we'll hear more from Barry throughout the morning, and we're so glad that you are here. Uh, because you're the ones who are going to go out and make a difference. We were just talking about making your own video, and I'm so thrilled to have truly some of the best videographers and photographers and artists who have committed their life to making a difference in their community. Uh, Doug and Eileen Loinig are very much involved in Big Picture, which is a wonderful project to, to beautify the city of Peoria, doing lots of great murals. But water has long been a passion for them, and... Um, uh, tell us a little bit about your connection to water. Well, first, wow. welcome Doug and Eileen. Let's give them a round of applause <laughs> for their Brian. great work. <laughs> tell us a little bit about your work, and especially as it relates to water. Well, I think um, we have been focused on uh, the possibility of, of doing things good for water ever since um, Clean Water Celebration began uh, well over 25 years ago. What is it now, 28? Yeah, 29? and maybe I should also say, these two have also been on the committee to help organize this event for many years, to help with publicity. They show up, they do the hard work so that we can bring this event to you. And, and part of the idea of focusing attention on water, um, the more you seek out things to find, 
uh, that you want to be a part of and, and be involved in, the more you do that, the more it becomes a reality of that's your focus. That's the thing that you really tend to um, pay attention to all the time. And when you do that and you go out with a camera and you start looking for things that water influence, water uh, effects, uh, still water, uh, moving water, all these things are easy to find. And finding a good picture of them is easily as, as doing it. And just doing it makes it happen eventually. And that gorgeous photography and videography is inspiring me. Just like over our shoulder, I, I, I have to admit, I'm blown away by these uh, Virginia yeah. bluebells. They exist because of the water, and these trees above us are moving water into the atmosphere, and, and there's water everywhere. And, and so, Eileen, what are one of your goals or primary goals in this, in this project, in sure. this work? Thanks, Brian. Um, I think, you know, as artists, you kind of question, you know, what can I do? You know, I can make something that people would put on their wall or maybe a sculpture or something. We've taken a little different approach that, as Doug mentioned, we use our photography and our videography to raise awareness of the natural environment. So we, we want people to have that focus. It's easy for all of us to turn on the tap and get a glass of water. We don't even think about it. But water is a precious resource, you know, as you say, all the natural world lives yeah. on, you know, needs well, water. So. And thanks to Illinois American Water, we have plenty of clean water to drink here. <laughs> yes, yeah. And, and the fact that American Clean, uh, American, uh, Illinois American Water is, is our supplier of our water, um, that water uh, they've been entrusted with uh, for over 150 years uh, here in Peoria, Illinois. But it is that kind of... Um, um, watching out for what it is that is important to a community and, and doing the work and all the people involved in doing that. I sound like an ad for American Water. <laughs> but it very much is a partnership with the, the companies that, that run the water system. And, and when we partner with them, we get wonderful things like the Clean Water Celebration. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I do want to sing your praises in particular. As a matter of fact, uh, today we are very excited to award the both of you for your long commitment to the Clean Water Celebration, for the beautiful work you do to raise awareness about water issues through your art. Uh, we would like to uh, give you the Making Waves oh, Award. Oh, if you want to go ahead you. and open thank it up. You. Everyone wow. loves the big reveal. Yes, this, yeah. this is an amazing uh, award. Award. Um, I got one a couple years ago, and I'm so glad that uh, we've we've changed to a new form. We've actually hired this beautiful local artist, Jeremy wow. Draper, as a glass blower, oh, and so you actually get the that. Earth glow. Isn't that beautiful? You beautiful. get a globe of water. That's great. That is beautiful. <laughs> For that your beautiful work, isn't that great? <laughs> and, and you know, and I have to say, we have attended the Clean Water Celebration for years and seen these awards being given out, and just <laughs> admire the drooled. people who made that. So thank you. We are honored. Well, yeah, you well deserved. It. And any one of you could earn this beautiful award yeah, if yes, you make a difference yeah. in your community. We love love giving out Making Waves Award. Cool. So we're about to watch your video. Um, one of the things that really captures me is all the places you've been. If you want to just quickly tell us a little bit about the making of and uh, some of the places we're going to go visit in just a minute on our next field sure. trip. I think what stands out in my mind is the uh, honey rice terraces oh, that we're going to kind gorgeous. of see in that. But um, when you go to an environment like that, the people there, it's the honey people of China, and they live in close... Um, work with the with the water in the area. They they recognize the importance of water in their lives because the rice terraces are done by that, and they work all as a, a communal group to support that. So it's really fascinating. It's not easy getting there. It takes a lot of little bus rides. Driving through the fog. And, and the fog. <laughs> through the water. Yeah. 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 Through the cloud sea. Cloud sea is yeah. how they oh, refer to the it. Cloud yeah, the yeah. cloud sea. I love that yeah. phrase. Yes. We should all use that next time we see a good fog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, again, thank you for your great work. And thank you yeah, for thank sharing you. this beautiful video with us yeah, and instruction and inspiration so you can make your own videos there and be go. part of our Clean Water Champion series. There yes. there yeah, there is so much beautiful water here, so we encourage everybody to water, go water out and everywhere. photograph it. <laughs> yeah, we're lucky. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. What do we all need every day, but we rarely even take the time to think about? You said water, you're right. You know, water is one of those things that we go to the faucet, we turn the tap, we fill a glass of water, we drink it, we put it down, and that's about the extent of what we think about water. Hi, I'm Doug Leinig. I'm Eileen Leinig. We are multimedia artists, and in collaboration with the Sun Foundation for the Clean Water Celebration, we have created a global water fountain 
that will be available for you all to download. In this download, we have some of our finest work that we are giving away because we know that it's important for the Sun Foundation Clean Water Celebration to focus on a very important message about water. We, we focus on water because we want to create a, a greater awareness of the value of water, the beauty of water. Uh, there's a scientific theory that something observed changes and what we believe is by watching the global water fountain you will increase your awareness of water and then in turn that will raise your appreciation and respect and love for this very valuable resource. Water is life. And it's a miracle. So we're going to share with you here just a couple backstories about some of our experiences in creating the Global Water Fountain and we're going to start with a taxi ride through the Cloud Sea in southern China. This is an area where the Hani people live and for over 1300 years they have farmed the mountainsides by creating terraces and they channel the water down from the forests above to sustain themselves and their crops. But as we're driving through the streets, we are not able to see, it's so thick, you can't even see the people that are on the sides of the road, and cars approaching appear out of nowhere. But once we arrive at the scene and we get out to shoot the pictures, we have seen the most beautiful images of our entire career. They're in the cloud sea, where the clouds come down and flow like waves through the valley. So now we're moving on to Iceland where literally the interior of the earth is coming out as steam in front of us and it's impacting the smell of it and everything is just, uh, what is it? It smelled like rotten eggs there. <laughs> there were some people who just couldn't take the smell, but it yeah. was fascinating. Iceland itself is a fascinating place. There's over 10,000 waterfalls on this island country. And, and glaciers, uh, there's like 269 glaciers that uh, are these immense mountains of, of ice and snow. Iceland is a remarkable place for water because it, it has all three states of water. It has liquid, it has steam, and it has the solid, ice. And those ice blocks that come off of the glaciers are as big as a house or as big as a car. The great thing about water is you don't have to travel the world to see it. It's right in your own backyard. Uh, in fact, in central Illinois, we have such a plethora of water that we, uh, we are connected to the Great Lakes and to the Gulf of Mexico with our body of water at, at, in central Illinois, the Illinois River. And in our photographic journeys, we've, we've gone to um, get ice, a, a big ice cascade. We've gone out in the winter here in Illinois and photographed snow, just another form of water. You know, water is one of those amazing substances that it can appear as solid, it can appear as steam, which you'll see in the Global Water Fountain, and the liquid form that we see flowing by in the Illinois River. You can even get puddles of, of water reflecting the world around us. And, and as the wind blows and water droplets form interesting patterns, uh, those are the things that we focus on in our photography. Because water is life. And so we encourage you to download the Global Water Fountain, but don't stop there. Create your own water art. We like to call uh, art for art's sake as art that you just produced because you want to. Well, we'd like people to shoot water for water's sake. That actually take your camera and shoot a puddle, shoot a, a water droplet, shoot water just for the sake of shooting a picture of water. You don't have to have a professional camera to shoot pictures of water. Any camera will do the job. All you have to do is use what you've got and just point it toward any water and take a picture. It doesn't have to be a beautiful picture. It doesn't have to be anything other than a picture of water. And the more you do it, the more you're loving.
We're so glad to have uh, Doug and Eileen in our community. Actually, we're so glad to have Doug and Eileen on the planet because they travel the world uh, filming water. And actually, one of the things, uh, if you go to our YouTube channel, you can watch that video whenever you like. Uh, but we're putting in a link so you can download your own screensaver that is this gorgeous perpetual fountain, very calming. I've seen their artwork actually in hospitals and doctor's offices because it's meditative and healing. When we heal our connections to the earth through water, uh, we're healing the planet and healing ourselves at the same time. And again, there's a lot of good lessons in there about what good videography looks like. How do you tell a good story? We'd love to see your video and add it to our series for Clean Water Champions. Also, if you go into the interactive game platform that we're launching today, go to the Sun Foundation, uh, launch the game. You can download it to your smartphone, your tablet. It's a really fun, uh, kid-friendly game with a lot of like Easter egg treasure hunt kind of stuff. Uh, and you can see some of their work there as well. Uh, but we're going to toss it back to Barry. This is one of my favorite songs that Barry wrote. Uh, we worked together for many years on the river. And uh, this is actually in part based on a little poem that I wrote that he turned into a much more beautiful song. Uh, river is a time machine. Barry Claude. Hey, thanks, Fox. What a pleasure to play this for you and, uh, and you out there. your spine, catch the emerald blue reflecting sun, passage to a simpler world is laying on the tide, ah oh, this river is a time machine, come on and take a ride, first time I left home, first time I was free. I got too close to this river's muddy shore Oh, that spirit of the water wrapped her current around me Ah, oh, this river is a time machine Take you where you long to be And we'll roll on back to those wilder days the Buffalo grazing on the plain mm, the Gamblers and their ladies in river towns You all remember their names like Peoria hey, thanks. so if you're feeling urge to travel on down the stream let that river open up her past her passion for an older time is floating on the foam oh this river is a time machine Come on, let the journey last, and we'll float on back to those longer days. Lazy wood smoke drifting through the trees. Oh, paddle wheels, wigwams, and buggy rides. If you're going, get on board with me. And feel the whistle blow. Right up your spine, catch the emerald blue reflecting sun. Passage to a simpler world is laying on the tide. Oh, this river is a time machine. Come on and take a ride. Oh, no. I said this river is a time machine, come on, take a ride. Thank you, Barry. That is such a sweet <laughs> song. And, uh, and wow, we're back in the field with Travis. Uh, Travis Wilcoxon is, is ready, and he's got the most phenomenal bird. This is the first time I've seen one this year. This bird was in South America a week ago, and it's just now arriving here in the Midwest. Um, and I'll let, you, I'll let Travis tell you more about what he's got in hand. 
Welcome back, Travis. Okay, well, my alarm, you hear me, hear me okay? Yes. yes. All right. So we have an American red start. The American red start, which is a migratory species that, again, has migrated up here from the tropics probably just this week. And also the first one I've seen this week uh, happens to be, of course, in a net and in my hand. Uh, this is a male. The females have yellow in most of the places where you can see orange and their bodies are overall more of a gray brown color and not this jet black color um and they're called american red starts which is great but i think they should be called american red never stops because when they're moving around <laughs> they never stop yeah. they, them they never stop uh, <laughs> so yeah we were excited to, uh, to see this one in the net uh, for sure it's uh, definitely a highlight of this morning um, we also have another migratory species over there in the bag if uh, they'd like to see something else, too. Yes, please. What else do you have? Have the other bag, Morgan. Morgan's going to come over here and hand this one off. We'll check in that one real quick. We'll put this red start back in his holding bag. All right, so we have one more migratory species, much larger than that one. You know, the red start and all of the warblers, I saw probably 15 warblers this weekend. It's amazing, they migrate from the jungles of South America to the boreal forest. So they're only here, some of them, for a couple of days. And this is the time of year to go out and see them. Oh, ooh. So we have a Swainson's thrush. <gasps> wow, that's another first of year. Yes, indeed, yeah. This is the first one I've seen this year, too. Um, this is one of the common birds that we banned here in both the spring and the fall during migration. Um, we have this... Uh, this line of dogwoods over there that especially in the fall they love to go eat with left berries um, but this is actually caught in that same area so swainson's thrush another migratory species that will not spend its summer here most likely it'll head on north uh, for breeding and come back through in the fall so we do have hermit thrush and wood thrush that are, are native and, and nest here in illinois i saw both of them this weekend and this is a great time to go out bird watching and you know um travis you and i've talked about this often as an amateur bird watcher, I'm not the trained professional you are, but I can, with my smartphone, go out and document the birds that we're seeing um, and use eBird. It's a great citizen science project, and that adds data. And we know that healthier rivers are, are migration routes for these birds. I mean, think about it. that bird in your hand could have been on the Amazon or maybe in Costa Rica just a couple weeks ago, and they come up the Gulf Coast, and then they follow the Mississippi North and up the Illinois River, across the Great Lakes, into the boreal forest. Just to map that out. We do have a game in the video platform. If you, if you go to you know, Sun Foundation website, there's a game where you can help birds migrate, and, uh, and you can see more of, uh, of Travis's video that we saw earlier. Um, thank you, and thank you, Morgan. You want to say hi, Morgan? <laughs> and, and Morgan, tell me a little bit about yourself in just a sentence or two. Uh, you're a student or? I'm a student. I'm graduating this May and I'm studying biology here at Millican. Okay. And what, what, uh, what brings you to birds and this project? The birds? I, I mean, bird banding in general and I love just being out here in the wildlife. Um, I also do a project, too, for my research with birds, specifically raptors. So, yeah. So, thank you again. We'll check back in with Travis later. But we're uh, here live at Forest Park. Um, I love that Swainson's thrush. Uh, and uh, we've got another guest here. Um, we actually have a four-legged guest along with a two-legged guest. Did you want to say something about this bird or is that the Swainson? No, Swainson. Okay. Yep. We'll talk to you later, Travis. Bye. Um, well, here at Forest Park, um, they've got some really great wildlife. Actually, first thing this morning while we were setting up, we had a group of wild turkey just over my left shoulder, and they were gobbling. And while we were doing our sound check, there was a woodpecker right here on the dead tree behind me. But living in this forest is a little four-legged friend, and our two-legged friend, Christy, uh, would like to tell you a little bit about him. Cool. So... This is, uh, this is Dot, and she is a wood turtle. So she's a turtle that lives primarily on land, but might spend a little bit of time in water. Um, we're a little bit south of her natural range, so she would probably be found more in like 
northern Illinois, Wisconsin area. Um, but she's a good example of a turtle that's native to the Great Lakes region. Um, and so it's really important to keep water sources clean for her and all of her cousins that are more of aquatic turtles, right? Right, yeah. so define, what is the difference between a, a turtle and a tortoise? Yeah, so, um, oh, you're, <laughs> see, I, I am a, a plant person, but, <laughs> um, so we have, we have turtles that live more in water, we have tortoises that live more on land, um, this one is called a turtle, it's a wood turtle, <laughs> that's the common name of it, so they do spend some time in the water. But they all depend on clean water. That is even true. Even the land tortoises, Yeah, yes. even the land tortoises need a, you know, clean water to drink and maybe to find some food in, um, but it's really important, especially like those pollutants. Uh, we don't want to get those in the water because mm -hmm. things like even something innocent, like say you're having a water balloon full light in your driveway and mm -hmm. then you hose off your driveway and those water balloons make their way to the, the storm sewer. Well, things like this, creatures like this could be really confused by those little pieces of balloons floating in the water, think it's something that they want to eat, gets in their gut. It could be really detrimental to them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And you are here for a different reason. Yeah. Um, so Christy and her cohorts here at Forest Park have been working with Living Lands and Water, our longtime friends, Chad Pagracki and Christy and, and uh, Michael. And they organize every year the River Sweep. And, and I just want to back up a little bit because Chad has uh, been a huge inspiration to me. Mm -hmm. Chad was one of CNN's Earth Heroes and he's gotten international recognition, deservedly so, because he and his team at Living Lands and Water have cleaned up the entire Mississippi River, including most of its major tributaries. We're on the banks of the Illinois River, the Missouri River, the Ohio River. After the hurricane hit uh, New Orleans, his crew went down and cleaned up New Orleans after Katrina. Uh, they've been on rivers on the Atlantic coast, the Potomac and, uh, uh, oh, I forget, the Anahinga, or no, uh, anyhow, the Anacosta, the Anacosta River that runs through Washington, D.C. Um, they've gotten uh, lots of attention from National Geographic. They had their own documentary made. Um, but this is the kind of thing started by a kid. I mean, Chad, Chad wasn't even into his 20s yet when uh, he uh, started cleaning up the Mississippi River. And then he built this organization where they recruit a lot of volunteers and they come here every year on the Illinois River. And you've been involved with that, Christy. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about your involvement with our local clean water sweep? Yeah, so the Illinois River Sweep was started, you know, many years ago. Um, at, at one point there was, um, you know, the, the Friends of the Illinois River started a cleanup. And so the Park District was the involved in that from, from the beginning. Um, and so, you know, this year we were really fortunate to partner with Living Lands and Waters on the Illinois River Sweep to add an additional element. They were able to help us uh, clean some of the islands in the middle of the river. Ah. Um, and then we also had teams working along the shore. That's great. About how many volunteers showed up this year? I think we had about 60 volunteers. Uh, we had a number of organizations help. Um, so that was really great. Yes. And, uh, and how many years have you been doing this? Um, so I want to say it's about... 14 or 15 years yeah. at this point. I kind of lost track during the pandemic, but yeah. it's and been ahead. a while. And because of your work with the, with the River Sweep, Barry is handing me <laughs> uh, this wonderful award that we would like to, oh, uh, to give you. to you because you are making waves. <laughs> you know, you. As an environmental educator here, we're really grateful for the hundreds or thousands of school kids who come through that you yeah. educate. You take care of turtles <laughs> because what we're doing today is not just important for us as two-leggeds, but also for the four-leggeds. And I will say, if I can go off on just one little uh, soapbox, I think our primary sin as humans is when we uh, delude ourselves to think that we're separate. Mm -hmm. As soon as we acknowledge the truth that we're all connected and what's good for the river, what's good for the river sweep, is good for turtles, is good for us, that we are all healthier and happier when we acknowledge those incredible connections. So because of your work, with the River Sweep, you and your entire team. We actually have awards for Susie oh, and wonderful. for Living Lands and Water, and we'll, we'll mail them to those. Yeah. You get your award. Do you want me to hold the turtle for uh, a moment while sure. you open your package? <laughs> Ooh, nice and warm. Yeah, she's uh, been hanging out inside the building. and. <laughs> I was hoping she was going to poke her head out. Yeah, she's uh, a little shy. Her and it's sister a little cold is a little bit uh, more 
active. Yeah. Oh, wow, this is amazing. It is really amazing. <laughs> I actually have mine sitting in an eastern window. So every morning at sunrise, the oh, sun comes through it. That is and that beautiful. is a handmade glass ball from uh, from Jeremy Draper Glass here in Peoria. Oh, you see wonderful. the swirl of water. That is so I love cool. that everyone is unique. Yeah, it reminds me of a whale or something. Yeah, so uh, you're featured in our next video. You want to just give us a sentence or two to introduce that video? Sure, yeah. So we actually had a, a wonderful videographer at the River Sweep this year. So he kind of came around with us and interviewed some of our volunteers and staff people that were doing the cleanup. Um, and so you get to kind of see what was happening back in September when we did that um, and see uh, some of the reasons why it's really important to clean up trash. That was my next question. Yes. So why is the River Sweep important? Right. So, I mean, first of all, we get our drinking water from the Illinois River, right? So it directly impacts our health if the river is out of whack. And um, whatever river you live on. Right. <laughs> yeah, or whatever groundwater or, or whatever you drink. Um, but it also impacts the health of creatures like this, all of the, the birds and waterfowl that use the riverway. Um, all of those creatures, including ourselves, are impacted by the health of the water. And we want to give the turtle the last word. Do you have anything to say before we introduce this next video? <laughs> she might give you a hiss. <laughs> you can make a difference. Yeah. You can be a clean water champion. Let's check out the river sweep. I'm currently standing in the woods that are right off the riverbanks of the Illinois River. We are located in Peoria, Illinois right now, where we are participating in the Illinois River cleanup sweep event. And what we are doing today is cleaning up garbage near the river, in the water, and on the shores of the Illinois River. So we are helping make this river system a little bit cleaner from all the debris and pollution that has washed up along the shores. We are a river cleanup organization that started in Hampton, Illinois, right on the Mississippi River, where we've expanded to a nonprofit organization today that's cleaned up 11 million pounds on 25 different river systems in 21 different states with the help of 118,000 volunteers. There are multiple ways that small pieces of garbage such as a plastic straw, plastic fork, but also large items like refrigerators and even tires can end up on land. One way is the smaller piece of, of items can end up here is just by simply from wind, um, you know, pollution, from our neighborhoods, by our gas stations, within our parks, where they can harm not only our water quality, but the animals that thrive off of these environments and these ecosystems as well. Well, I am actually an environmental science major, so I care very deeply about the environment. Um, once I heard about the opportunity, I jumped at it to gum and pick up all the garbage that's left along the river. We're living in the Illinois River Shed, which is all the area outside of the Illinois River, everything will flow into this river and that'll flow into the Mississippi and that'll flow into the ocean. So wherever you are, that always has a um, potential impact to float anywhere else. So if you are driving in your car down the street and you throw your pop cup out the window, it floats down the storm sewer. It ends up in places like this where it's being swept out into the river. And so, you know, you might not think about the impact of doing something like that here, being far away from other places, but those things can travel a long ways. And that's why we end up with like giant garbage patches in the ocean. So even here, a long ways away, um, we can make an impact on the global environment as well. So what way can you guys help at home? There are so many ways that you guys can eliminate and even reduce plastic in your personal world. One example is refusing plastic straws at restaurants to go drive through areas. We're trying to connect people with nature. We're trying to get people out into these spaces so that they can appreciate the treasures that they have in their own backyard and help to take care of those spaces. So we have special guests that uh, surprised me. <laughs> I'm so glad they could be here to receive their award in person. Uh, these are students and teachers from Mark Bills Elementary who have established this incredible recycling program school-wide. Would you like to tell us just a little bit about the recycling? Sure, Brian. Our students from our life skills room, they go to each classroom and collect uh, the recycling uh, that e each class collects. They do that twice a week. And they also, they put it in large bins, they sort it, 
according to what the material is. Plastic paper. Yes, pa plastic aluminum, paper, cardboard, yeah. aluminum. Yeah. And then we uh, we bag that up, and then we put that in the appropriate receptacle. That's so, great. And like I said, they do, they do that twice a week. So what's your favorite part of this job? Getting out of class. <laughs> Getting out of class. Well, yeah. Elijah, Elijah does a great job pushing pushing those big bins. Oh, yeah. A That's a job. chore. Yes. Yeah. And for you, is there a part that you really like to do? Yeah. What is that? Push the car. He's like, he likes to push the car. Push the car. Yes. yes. Yeah. And so the other students in the school help to fill the carts as you're going down the hall? They do. And it all goes into the bin out back? Yes, it does, sir. I, I might be putting you on the spot, but uh, any idea numbers? How many pounds or tons or what kind of waste? Well, we do it, like I said, twice a week, and we probably collect maybe 10 bags uh, of, of garbage Every, yes. every two weeks. that comes yes. out of the garbage so stream. So 10 pounds of, or 10, 10 bags. Pounds. Yes, 10 bags. That is not going into the waste stream, but is, is being recycled. Yes. You know, I've, I've, I've toured in Europe quite a bit, and I and actually was in, in China just a couple years ago. It amazes me how schools around the world, that's your standard operating procedure. Mm -hmm. They have three bins. You have a, a garbage bin, you have a recycling bin, and then you have a composting bin. Yes. And that's just normal. And I wish that were more the norm here. But because you are pioneers, because you are making that happen in a local Peoria school, we are thrilled to give you a Making Waves Award. Thank you. So you can go ahead and open that. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll let you know, I'll have Elijah Travis. <laughs> While Elijah's opening that, every year we're looking for student groups who are making a difference. So if you have friends who want to get together, we actually produced a video on how to be a clean water champion if you go to our, uh, our YouTube channel. And... Tell us about your work. You know, give yourself a pat on the back. Uh, give us a shout out and we'll give you a shout out in return. And uh, maybe you could be a clean water champion and win a Making Waves Award. So what do you think, Elijah? Yeah? That's awesome. Okay. Well, you very up. much deserved it. Thank you so much to the committee and the donors for this wonderful award on, on behalf of the students at uh, Mark Bill's uh, middle school. We, we want to thank you. And thank you. And, uh, and to the person who nominated them, who's also on our committee and has done a lot of great things, you've earned several of these. Have you received one yet? Yes. <laughs> well, I yeah, did. I thought you had. <laughs> so uh, let's hear it again for Mark Bill's. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, we have another video lined up for you, another student group. These are actually preschoolers who are making a difference. Now we have elementary school, we've seen some high schoolers earlier, but these are preschoolers at Valeska Hinton Elementary, or preschool, uh, who have planted their schoolyard as a Monarch way station. And the day we were there filming, we actually had monarchs coming through. It was beautiful, it was last fall, when the monarchs were on their migration. What really blows my mind, just think about this for a moment, tiny little butterfly flies from here all the way to Mexico. Now, if that by itself isn't astounding, even more astounding, they will overwinter there in a, in a dormant state. Uh, it's a stupor. Um, and then they will begin the journey north, but the same one doesn't fly all the way back. They'll stop off in North Texas or Mexico. They'll lay eggs. The eggs will hatch, eat some milkweed, uh, form a, a chrysalis, become an adult, metamorphosize, and then that child will fly to Tennessee or Kentucky. They'll lay eggs on a milkweed. The eggs will hatch, become a caterpillar. The caterpillar will become a chrysalis, will become an adult, and the second or third generation will make it back here to Illinois, lay eggs, and their grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren of the one who started, will go on to Canada. If you plant milkweed in your garden, you can create a way station much like these students at Villisca Hinton. Hi, my name is Mary Keldner and I would like to welcome you to the world of Valeska Hinton Early Childhood Education Center, a part of Peoria Public Schools. Here at Valeska Hinton, our focus is on educating families. And in this aspect of educating families, we want our children and their parents to become citizen scientists. We do that through the Monarch Project each and every year. 
Here at Valeska Hinton, our children begin by learning about the life cycle of the monarch butterfly. In their classroom, they will raise monarch caterpillars from egg through each of the instars. Now, an instar is very important because that means for our children, they start out really little and get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Our parents spend a great deal of time working both in the classroom and around the school. It's our goal that as parents, they become the educators of their children supported by the staff at Valeska Hinton. Part of this project allows parents to work with their children in the classroom, learning about the caterpillars and the butterflies. We also host a wonderful parents' night where parents will come to school and they build life cycles together. They teach their children that the caterpillar begins as an egg and when it emerges, it's a teeny tiny caterpillar then it goes into a chrysalis and finally it closes and becomes a monarch butterfly. We love to enrich our children's lives and their parents by teaching them the vocabulary that's important to science. In addition to learning about just the life cycle of the monarch butterfly, our children learn about migration. Now migration is a very complicated term for three and four and five year olds to learn, but we turn this into play. Play is such an important aspect of a child's education. At Valeska Hinton, we believe all things can be taught through play. Our children will begin to learn about the migration by understanding that the monarchs spend the winter in Mexico and they travel across America all the way through central Illinois and into Canada, where again, they'll turn around and fly back to Mexico. We have a game where they wander through our halls dressed in monarch butterfly costumes and they play games as they run, jump, leap, and fly through our hallways. Parents love to watch them do this. In addition to playing games and building life cycles, we raise over 400 monarch butterflies every year at this school. 26 classrooms participate in this process. Children are scientists and walk room to room where they count how many chrysalises we have, how many caterpillars we have. They talk about whether we had a larger proportion make it to the butterfly stage or if we still have more as caterpillars so they're learning wonderful math and science aspects. And at the end of our monarch unit, everyone gathers on the front lawn and we release over 400 monarch butterflies in hopes that they will make it to Canada and again return to Mexico that winter. Because in the spring, we have typically the second generation of monarchs, but when we do our, our big release party in the fall, we are on the fourth generation. And this generation is the most important generation because they're going to travel to Mexico where they'll winter and once again, the life cycle begins. And that is what we want families to take away. That not only do you have the ability to impact your child's education by teaching them about science and math and art through the monarch butterfly, but you have the ability to impact our world when you become citizen scientists and participate in our Monarch Project. Well, I, I personally love Monarchs, and we've actually done a couple of videos. If you go to our YouTube channel, uh, you can see the, uh, the videos we've done about Monarch Migration and Monarch Way Stations. Um, I hope you subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've created 45 mini documentaries, many of them created by students and celebrating student projects. You get to go on field trips. Everyone is a classroom friendly field trip and everyone comes with lesson plans. And one of the first videos we shot was my good buddy, Barry Cloyd, doing a songwriting workshop. Um, and uh, instead of just you know giving Barry a minute for a song in between things, uh, uh, I'd like to just say thank you, Barry, for coming out this morning. Well, thanks for and, asking. And uh, tell us a little bit about your songwriting workshop. Well, I was uh, fortunate years ago through, uh, through Fox's influence and some other friends who were involved in clean water uh, to be asked to do songwriting workshops for fifth and sixth graders. And I did it for several years until the pandemic came along, and now it's, it's virtual stuff at this point in time. But uh, it really was uh, enlightening and eye-opening to work with uh, such a, a, a wide variety of really uh, smart kids, really interested kids. And uh, we literally go into a classroom in the Civic Center, and uh, there was a whiteboard against the wall, and we'd start throwing out ideas. And, and one of the beauties of, of, of writing a song uh, in a songwriting workshop where you have uh, a focus, which of course is clean water and the river and how valuable it is to all of us, um, is that you don't have to worry about the inspiration. The inspiration has already been handed to you, which is a really a, a great gift. And so you take that and work with it. And uh, I'd talk to the kids about, you know, what they felt when they walked by the river or they walked by their favorite a stream or a lake. 
or the ocean. And, and what were those feelings that came around? We start writing words on the board and pretty soon start playing with a melody and playing with a lyric. And, and before long, we had, we had a song. And, and I did it several times with these kids and I was always just thrilled and amazed to see what we came up with. And uh, this is one of them. And this song was actually used in uh, our opening video, right. and every year it opens the Clean Water Celebration. It's a really nice piece, knowing it was written by students. Yeah, but before you play the song, yeah. uh, just a word or two about yourself and your career as a songwriter and what brings you to the clean water. Well, uh, I was born and raised here in Peoria on the banks, of the, not on the banks, but on, you know, near the Illinois River. And I've been, I've been crossing over this beautiful stream all my life and, and got a... Uh, a wonderful chance to work with uh, Fox and other some some other wonderful entertainers on the Spirit of Peoria Riverboat for 22 years, and uh, and being on the river like that, and, and kayaking, and and uh, being fond of the oceans and the lakes and, and all bodies of water, they're fascinating, aren't they? I mean, come on, really, uh, it it begins to make you think about how valuable that uh, that water is to us, and and the river is in, is always inspirational to me. It always has been ever since I've, since I've been on it. It's just such a, a thing of beauty as well as a thing of uh, in, intense value. And, and the more we, we're able to, to pass that along to people and, and let them see uh, the importance of, of clean water in the river, uh, the better off we all will be. And that's, it's, it's been one of the focuses of my, uh, my writing is, is the river. And uh, if you're ready for yes. that song, This is I'll such a it. great song. We'd love to hear it. It's called River Song, and it was written by myself and the fifth grade students of Riverview Grade School. Tranquility, majesty, peace through understanding Of that giant old river running through my hometown Standing on the bank, lost in the distance Imagining the future with the past flowing down Can you see her in the light of a bright spring morning? Is she hidden in the shadows of warm October's past? Is the moonlight on the water reflecting your passion? What are we gonna do to make it last? Gotta wrap your loving arms round the heart of that river Pass along her stories that you've heard for so long Take a stand from Mother Nature and her hypnotizing waters sing that river song. Can you see her in the light of a bright spring morning? Is she hidden in the shadows of a warm October past? Is the moonlight on the water reflecting your passion? What we're gonna do to make it last? Tranquility, majesty, peace through understanding Of that giant old river running through my hometown Standing on the bank, lost in the distance Imagining the future with the past rolling down Wrap your loving arms round the heart of that river Pass along the stories that you've heard for so long. Take a stand for Mother Nature and her hypnotizing waters. Sing that river song. Sing that river song. Oh, sing that river song. Thank you, Barry Cloyd. That's Thank great. Um, so we're, we're going to check back in with Travis here. Uh, that Swainson's Thrush, they've been doing some tests on. And, uh, uh, and Travis uh, still has that Swainson's Thrush. Travis, you're there? So Travis is out in the field at the Illinois Raptor Center. He and his, his students are banding birds. Uh, but this Swainson's thrush, we wanted to come back to because they're doing some rather intriguing blood tests and looking at bird health. Um, Travis, what do you have to tell us? So Travis, Travis. there, I was, I was muted. muted. Uh, trying to run several things at once. There you go. 
Um, so tell us about uh, the blood test and the, and the bird health that, uh, project that this bird banding is part of. Yeah, so one of the things that is most important to try to understand about uh, bird feeding activities is whether or not it actually helps the birds. I think most people want to believe it does, and um, obviously if you see birds coming back, you know, you think you see the, the same bird coming back and over again, you know, you hear, hear people say, oh, that's my cardinal, you know, and he relies on my food and he comes here every day. And, well, that might be true, um, but whether or not having, you know, quickly available food uh, that is not very nutri <laughs> very nutritionally diverse uh, is really good for them. Uh, it's similar to asking the question, like, if I can just go get a quick cheeseburger at McDonald's every day, is that necessarily the best food for me? Um, so really the best way to answer those questions is to get birds and get blood samples from them and do full uh, health physicals, similar to what you would do if you went to the doctor and, and they were trying to decide if you too were healthy. Uh, and so we spent um, three years working on a study. We caught over 3,000 birds and, and, and answered that question. Uh, and the answer is, in general, uh, the food that's provided by bird feeders does provide some health boosts throughout the year. Um, there's a little bit more disease transmission that occurs at feeders, which is something that, you know, to be to be wary of. Um, but we also found that if you take the feeders away, the birds just go back to eating other things and that their population doesn't crash. So they're not dependent upon your feeders, but they are using them to supplement their, their other foods that they eat. Well, I did have the great good fortune to read your scientific paper. Thank you for sending me a copy. Uh, I've always fed birds and wondered that same question. Am I, does, is it good for birds? And I was intrigued at how it changes their fat levels, possibly helps them with migration. What are some of the other ways that uh, feeding has an impact? Sure, so we found that uh, their antioxidant levels were higher, their stress levels were lower, so they just, they manage better uh, in, in nature. So, and, and we found it to be most important in a year where there was a severe drought. So in, in a year where we saw a severe drought, we obviously couldn't plan that. We had our feeders out there. And the birds at the feeder sites had the biggest gap in the overall quality of their health on the positive health on the positive side relative to the birds that didn't have the feeders. Um, so that's pretty consistent too. With we know that right when there's a really harsh winter or a blizzard, sometimes they might rely more on it. Uh, but in general, you know, birds are are finding all kinds of diverse things to eat. Almost every bird that eats at the feeder also eats insects and other types of food sources and doesn't eat, just eat seeds. Uh, and so we, we did find that in general at the sites where we had feeders that we tended to have more, uh, what we call second year birds show up over the next winter at those sites. So it suggests that perhaps that food source might've also helped them with some of the reproductive success um, and, and having their babies survive through the winter. That's, That's great. great. So uh, the takeaway is Feed the birds, but what were what were the negative impacts of, with disease? Yeah, so the negative impacts of disease are that uh, a bird that is because we were banding birds, we were able to track individuals that were coming back to feeders. Uh, diseased birds are more likely to come back to the feeders, which probably because they're not feeling well and it gives them a chance to eat. But the challenge there is when the other birds come to the feeders, they too might be exposed to that bird. So. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very relevant topic right now because we have avian influenza um, uh, epidemic or epizootic moving throughout the bird population. And, you know, the state Department of Natural Resources has recommended taking feeders down uh, at least until migration is done and birds sort of go about their business to their nesting sites and, and don't move around as much. Uh, and, you know, songbirds aren't affected by the influenza perhaps as much as ducks and geese or raptors, but that doesn't mean that they still can't spread it. So. The, the one challenge always with bird feeding is it brings birds in close contact with each other in ways that they wouldn't normally outside of the feeders, and that just increases the risk of disease transmission. Yeah, I think I learned this metaphor from you. It's like when you first go to kindergarten, and the first time you're around a bunch of kids, you're going to pick up like impintago or pink eye and those kinds of things. And it's funny because birds actually get pink eye from other birds around the feeders. So the takeaway for me was to clean your feeders, clean your feeders, clean your feeders. And so I do wash my feeders regularly and, and occasionally take a little squirt bottle with, uh, with perox hydrogen peroxide because it sterilizes and then breaks down and evaporates so there's no lasting lingering chemicals because it's just oxygen and, and uh, hydrogen. Just, uh, it's a, it's a non-toxic non kind of uh, sterile way to sterilize. Well, Travis, thank you for sharing your birds with us. Thank you for your ongoing bird counts. We'll see you at the Bishop Hill Hummingbird Festival in August. Uh, 
If you're interested in learning more about birds, you could look up Travis's research papers. Um, but also, uh, thanks for your work with the Illinois Raptor Center and uh, the important research you're doing there. Um, but I understand you have a class to get back to. Yes, I do. <laughs> so, so thanks for spending the morning with us. We now have a couple special, special guests. guests. Um, who have been core members of this event for a long time. And uh, I'm really excited that they, they could uh, show up because these are two of the very important people who've been doing a lot of the behind the scenes work. Yeah, scoot that over a little bit so it's between you. Um, uh, Karen Zuckerman and Sue Atherton, I think have been on the committee from nearly the beginning. The beginning. The beginning. <laughs> and we're close to 30 Sue years. Has. Yeah, I 30 years <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah more than 25, because I remember our 25th anniversary. Yes, yes. It's... And so I love this idea that we have brought two to 4,000 kids, usually above two, close to 3,000 kids every year to this event. And I call it boot camp for environmental activism. That we're giving kids the skills and the tools they need to go out and make a difference, to be a clean water champion. And so, Sue, since you've been here from the beginning, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about those early days and what are some of your fond memories? Well, the, the uh, very first event we had with Sun Foundation was um, they had invited uh, Jean-Michel Cousteau to come to Peoria. Jacques Cousteau's son? Jacques Cousteau's son, wow. yes. And so immediately we got school kids involved to create um, artwork and... Um, making little mini presentations to imagine what the ocean would be maybe in 30 years, what it would be like today. Mm -hmm. And so that was the beginning along with um, Dr. Bob Williams and SIU students uh, for the Illinois Rivers Project. And we combined with them to create the first clean water celebration. 29 years ago. 29 yeah, years yeah. ago. This is the 29th yeah. year. I missed yeah. the first couple, but I Didn't think I've, I've been yeah. to 27 or yeah. 8 of them. I think you um, have. Yeah, and and I know that it, one of your very important behind the scenes roles is, you know, publicity and, and press releases. And uh, Sue helped to create that wonderful little opening, uh, thanking all of our sponsors. Um, so from your work in, in public relations, how can we as average Joe and Jane help get the word out about clean water? What are some good effective ways to, to spread the word? Well, actually just word, word of mouth, uh, anything uh, by your actions. Kids see kids doing some, some things and they go, oh, that's okay, I can pick up garbage, I can pick up litter, I can clean up the river. Um, but it's kind of that social media, just, if you know, just keep talking about it. Yeah. Some people feel like they're the only one feel a little stupid, you know, stopping, picking up garbage or whatever they may be. Well, I know Dr. Bob who helped to create this, uh, good friend. He almost always has a garbage bag with him. And every time he's out on the trail, his goal is to pick up at least one piece of litter every day. And, uh, and by doing that, he sets an example to hopefully inspire others to not drop litter <laughs> uh, when they see him picking it up they think twice about putting it down um so you're right that that kind of set the example use social media so i guess you could also share the link to our videos and to our our platform to get your friends excited now karen um you help to coordinate the teachers um so and and you also write all of our standards uh, to make sure we're meeting all those national education standards so what do you, what do you think is the impact for teachers, what, what are the, the takeaway for teachers and why is this important for, for the classroom? Well, I, I taught for 45 years. And so for me, um, this was so important and that's why I got involved, right? Yeah. And, and, work with the stand, and work with tying things to the standards. I didn't create the standards. Okay. But, right. <laughs> right. But you make sure that we match them and figure that's out which right. ones we match. Um, I think it's, it's really important to get kids outside and to get kids involved in what is their world and how things work, how, their, how everything works around them and how their environment, anything that, any actions they take has an effect on, on their daily lives. And so um, by incorporating that into whatever you do in your classroom, it just makes it easier for all of us to understand the connections well, give us a couple of examples, because I know that you taught it at Hollis, and you did some really great projects. So what are some outside the classroom projects that you and your students did that may be inspired by the Clean Water Celebration? Oh, okay. So um, we are blessed at Hollis to be very close to a stream, 
And so students would often go to the stream and um, in, their, in, the, in that process, not only just cleaning the stream, but we would take a look at the critters there and kind of monitor um, what the water quality was like based on the kinds of critters we found. So we did some, some good, nice um, macro invertebrate yes. studies. Yes, can you say banthic <laughs> macro <laughs> invertebrate <laughs> indicator <laughs> analysis? What? Well, how does that work? Um, well, you kind of search around in um, the debris and everything that you find in, the, in that stream, and then you collect very carefully what is that debris, and you sort it sort through it and you find all of these wonderful critters that are living there. And depending on which ones you have, you kind of know how much oxygen is available because each, each of us needs a certain <laughs> yeah. amount, right? Mm -hmm. And totally. we can only live in a certain area <laughs> that, that is present. And so then you just take account and measure that against a standard and you're there. And so certain bugs mean healthy and no bugs mean get out of the water and call the EPA. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess so, I guess so. And then there were a lot of opportunities where there were, um, where you could um, actually test the water with chemical testing strips. So we could do a little chemistry and we could, we could send our results into different groups that were working with Paul, like Paul Ritter does mm -hmm. at Pontiac mm -hmm. High School. They did a big push for atrazine. So we tested for atrazine in that, st that stream. Yes. And we went down the river because that's not far from Hollis, Hollis Grade School. But, um, a lot of the projects that um, have come to us through Clean Water Celebration haven't just been schools in, in an area near the river. There are lots of schools that have done insect and bird studies even in um, in a more urban area, like mm -hmm. like where I live up by Bradley University. So. Yeah. And actually, I want, to, I want to take that opportunity to kind of go off on a little bit of tangent. So we, we did invite Paul Ritter, but his students actually were at two different conferences this weekend. I know yes. I was at one of them. <laughs> and so they couldn't make the trip this morning. Uh, we, we have several videos that they've produced as part of our program, including Operation Endangered Species, where they've recovered uh, snapping turtles, raised them in the classroom, released more than 400 of this endangered snapping turtle, and turned it loose into former habitat to uh, restore the habitat, but also restore the snapping turtle. And the best thing about endangered, uh, Operation Endangered Species, in my mind, is they wrote the set of lesson plans so that you could pick an endangered species in your area and replicate, instead of sna alligator snapping turtles, maybe it's a frog. And there have been students who have reintroduced frogs, like a, I think it's a Pacific tree frog along the Pacific coast, and salmon runs on both Atlantic and Pacific. So what are the endangered species? How could you raise them in your classroom, restore habitat? Paul and his students have won international praise for the P2D2, which is one of my favorite videos they <laughs> produced. Uh, P2D2 prescription drug um, disposal program, and which instead of throwing your prescription drugs when you're you know, not using them down the toilet where they go right into the waterway, um, they've actually collected millions, millions of pounds of these and they incinerate them, which breaks down the chemicals into a safer form, but they generate heat and they're heating hundreds of thousands of homes so they're doing good on both sides uh, with their P2D2 program, picked up by dozens of states. Um, they're right now very much involved in 3030, and actually at the conference, uh, they gave me a stack of postcards. So I want to give you guys a postcard okay, right. if you Thank don't you. have one yet. And everybody else gets <laughs> oh, yeah. a postcard. Bell, you get a postcard. Curry. You get a postcard. Oh, nice. And you send it to Very our governor go. to protect this wonderful little prairie that's uh, endangered, that's threatening to build a road through it, and it's a high-quality virgin prairie. And by saving those little spots, we, our eventual goal, student-led project, is to save 30% of the state by the year 2030. And intriguing, I've heard Angela Merkel in Germany talk about this, and I've heard uh, Joe Biden, the United States president, talk about a nationwide program that is very much student-led. Students have written legislation. They're on a committee to help the state reach the goal of 30 by 30. I could go on all day about Paul Ritter's projects. Um, Paul and his students at Pontiac Township High School, check them out in our video series. Um, They've been part of the team as well. They've actually made music for us. Um, so a little bit more about um, the history looking forward. From either or both of you, what do you well, see is, are the next few steps? What are we doing soon? And what's upcoming with the Clean Water Celebration? 
Well, I think we kind of see it. We've had a couple of pandemic years where we have created the a virtual um, platform. We had a collaboration, which we've always had since the very beginning with Illinois American Water. They have uh, really uh, helped support us and carry us through the years. Um, but uh, last year, we launched a virtual world that you can explore the Peoria Riverfront with Recycled Robin. And by doing those games and activities, you learn about how to preserve and how to help out what you can do to help out in your environment. And then from here... <laughs> uh, Karen, since you've been more involved in the game development, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what you find new and exciting? And just today, we've launched version 2.0 of, right. uh, of the game platform. So what are your some of your favorite parts? Oh, okay. So my favorite parts um, are running around and collecting um, the, the duck stamps. And um, there, there are scavenger hunts there. Um, there are videos to watch. There are activities you could plant, native plantings. Um, and we learned a lot in developing the first version one. And, and we have found ways to connect things. So, so now you just don't sort plants. You, you're going to be planting plants, and you're going to be able to take the compost you made over in your activity on sorting the, yeah. sorting the waste yeah. and bring it over and plant it in the garden and see what happens. So there's a lot of interacting um, that are interactive activities that are going to happen that relate to each other. Um, you can win trophies in different by watching different video segments, and you can you will be building a wetland ecosystem. And what's really cool is, and I had to learn how to do this just recently, so it really works. Is when when you unlock the each time you win the trophy, you unlock something, and that's part of the wetland. But when you go there and you focus, and then left click and you keep left clicking, it will cycle through. So every time you will see up close versions of each of your parts of the ecosystem, the tadpoles, the Daphnia, even the little teeny <laughs> tiny Daphnia. The, yeah, they're not quite single celled organisms, <laughs> but they are microscopic. Yeah. And they're an important part of the food chain. They're, right. they're, they're like the foundation of the whole web of life. And that, that's actually one of the games I've not had a chance to play yet because it just launched. We got a little bit of a sneak peek uh, because we're on the committee and we're helping to develop yeah. that. Um, so I'm really looking forward to getting diving into the game and spending some time. Um, so Barry, uh, you got another song for us here? Um, but before we hand it back to Barry, I do want to thank um, Karen and Sue and Joan Erickson and um, all the wonderful committee, Karen Cotton. I mean, there's a number of people who have been working really hard um, at, to put this together. A few names I'm sure I've forgotten. You want to give a shout out to? Uh, Angela Madison, Tim Noonan. Noonan. Right. Oh, and Tim Noonan and students. Yes. Tim Noonan yes. students have yeah, been our guinea pigs. Yeah, they have been our yes. guinea pigs, our, yeah. our test audience. Yeah. And um, let's see, a lot of the sponsors, yes. uh, actually the new version is thanks to the American Water Charitable Foundation, yes. who, who gave exactly. us the funding to help us upgrade. All right. Yeah, I felt like the first year we're turning, we're learning how to develop these kinds of games. And now that we've got a foundation, the new version connects the games like the great web of life. And, and when you play this game and succeed, you get points that helps you with another game. And it's kind of cool to see how those games connect. I'm well, looking forward to spending more time I there. think the other important thing is that what, what our, our focus is going to be on is for next year. And if we can, we can do something virtually with the in-person event because that's what builds from person to person right. and, yeah, and we're counting school to on school and in we're, person, yeah, right? we're, right. we're <laughs> counting on in person next year. We'll still have the virtual platform up, which is fantastic because it's available anytime. Yeah, you can play on your on your smartphone, your laptop, your tablet, and it's it's there 24-7. Um, and uh, we you know, we'll maintain that game uh, for the foreseeable future. We're actually launching a new game later this year, Find the Birds, um, that looks at bird <laughs> migration along the Illinois Flyway. And I, I can't wait to see that. I've already seen some of the sneak peeks. So this is an ongoing project. Please follow. Please subscribe. Uh, please share it through social media, as, as Sue said, and, uh, and help us all to connect. Um, but a special thank you to our sponsors, to Illinois American Water and the Charitable Foundation, to Illinois Valley Yacht Club, the Twin Flower Inn, Amarin, uh, right. yeah. Pure Academy of Science, Pure Academy of uh, Science, yeah. and we'll we'll roll those credits again at the end. Um, 
but also to all the people who present. I mean, normally we have about 40 or 50 presenters. And since they couldn't all be here, uh, we, we've made many documentaries, videos of their work. But next year we will be in person. So mark your calendar. Do we have dates? April 20, no, yes, April 23rd Third. and 24th. April 23rd, <laughs> 2023. 2023 at the Peoria Civic Center. We'll see you there in person. But Barry has another song for us. And then we have another special guest. Well, it's hard to find the time these days Just slow down So many things to do Days racing by and it sometimes Seems like there's no time left for you Do you need to let it all just roll right down to the sea Take a break from that day to day That riverboat whistle says come on with me and just let your worry slip away. You're on river time. River time. You're on river time. Take off your watch. Shut down that phone. Ease your mind. Don't let it slide. You're on river time. You're on river time. You were working for a living nearly all your days. Punching that clock to get you through. Or working no play. Well, you know what they say. So just let that river work for you. You're on river time. River time. You're on river time Take off your watch Shut down that phone Ease your mind Let it slide You're on river time You're on river time Go out and get you some Get on river time Well, uh, we have another virtual guest, though I tell you they are live and in the flesh in their classroom in the Quad Cities. So they're on the banks of the Mississippi River. You know, we're all connected by rivers. And I am really excited uh, to have Nicolina and her friends who've been doing this really wonderful project. I won't say too much about it because they've got a presentation that they would like to share with us that... Uh, helps us to learn more about Nicolina's turtles. Take it away, Nicolina, it's all yours. Okay. Hello, this is Single Use Plastic, the challenge in your solutions. I'm Nicolina Pappas from Nicolina's Troll Co. I'm the founder of Nicolina's Troll Co. I'm an 11 year old youth activist from Illinois and I founded Nicolina's Troll Co. in 2018. Hi, I'm Camden Palmer. I'm a volunteer for Nicolina Sturdo Co., 11-year-old youth activist. I live in Illinois and started volunteering in late 2021. I'm Lillian Vogel. I'm a volunteer for Nicolina Sturdo Co. I'm an 11-year-old youth activist from Iowa. I started volunteering in early 2021. Today, what we're going to go over uh, is Nicolina Sturdo Co., how we affect the environment, and what you can do. First off, let's start with Nicholas Turtle Co. I founded Nicholas Turtle Co. three years ago when I was just eight years old when I realized that there was a problem with single-use plastics and also a solution was needed to carry reusable straws. I am focused on making and selling creative straw pouches with metal straws, donating all profits, and I have evolved into a volunteer network of friends and family. Nicolina's Turco has donated $4,000 to date to adopt animal ambassadors and fund conservation and education. And we continue to evolve our conservation efforts, cleanups, workshops, outreach, artivism. Now we're going to be talking about how we affect the environment. Plastic takes about 500 years to decompose. 
During those 500 years, plastic pollutes the oceans with harmful chemicals and entangle them be ingested by many creatures and breaks down into tiny microplastics. One example is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is just a floating heap of garbage out in the Karen? Pacific Ocean. What you probably don't know is that there's an estimated 1.1 trillion pieces of plastic floating in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, and it's growing every day. In addition to polluting the land, much garbage, mostly plastics, finds its way to waterways, eventually leading to the ocean. Some beaches are coated with tons of garbage, including both large and tiny microplastics. 18 billion pounds of plastic waste flow into the oceans every year. This adds to the massive amount of plastic garbage in all five major oceans, whatever that is. in the North and Pacific, North and South Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean, which has created five ocean garbage patches. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch is twice the size of Texas and growing. We focus on the animals, but it is, all, it is also important to note that humans ingest about 44 pounds of microplastics in their lifetime as it finds its way into our food and waterways. Next, let's talk about what you can do, how you can find solutions for clean water. Pace yourself. Many people thrive on being problem finders, pointing out what is wrong. What if we were all solution finders? Stop saying what's wrong, but instead figure out how you can help fix it. A problem finder would say, there's so much trash on that sidewalk. A solution finder might pick up the trash, organize a larger cleanup, ask the city to place a garbage can in the area, and post before and after cleanup pictures to show others how easy it is to make it. A problem finder would say, most places won't even recycle plastic bags. A solution finder might take, three, might take reusable bags, upcycle plastic bags into so many projects, talk to store or restaurants to ask them to stop using plastic bags, or charge a fee to discourage their use, talk to the local recycling centers about options, and work with stores to educate customers. Some of our solutions are that I saw we need a solution for plastic straws in our community. So I started refusing plastic straws. Then we created a fun pouch to carry metal straws, figured out how to sell the pouch and straw sets, researched local conservation organizations and donating all profits, including funding, conservation, and education. We convinced our school to stop using straws during our lunch convinced a few restaurants to stop giving out straws unless they are requested, organized an artivism campaign at our school, and began organizing cleanups to help with littering of single-use plastics and other garbage. Reduce, reuse, recycle, refuse, repurpose. Reduce the amount of waste you make. Reuse what you have. Recycle what can be recycled. Refuse items that are not environmentally friendly repurpose items into things that are more useful for you. These solutions cover most of what can be done to combat the single-use plastic problem. Let's talk about some simple examples. Start small. Some eco-friendly swaps you can do are reusable water bottle, metal or glass containers, slow fashion, or even a reusable food wrap. Now let's step it up a bit. How about participating in a cleanup? Join a community little cleanup. Start your own group cleanup. All you need are gloves and ba bags, or take a bag on your next walk and grab what you can see. There's a big trend that's gaining traction called blogging. It's picking up trash while you go for a jog. I swear I didn't just make that up. <laughs> Don't know where to start? Try social media. I asked my dad to put a post on Facebook because he's a gazillion followers who are mostly local and mostly old to ask for suggestions as to where my community has a litter, has a litter problem that we can handle. 
Within a day, I had about a dozen suggestions and many offers to help. My dear people, who are your friends, classmates, and family members that will help you? I've recruited all of them. Camden even submitted a resume. A resume. I started asking people to help, and some people were asking to join us. Next, you can find your network. There are organizations around you who share your passion. Can't find them? Look at Instagram. People around the world are finding solutions and want to help. I started to reach out to local organizations by email. Now they can't get rid of me. Living Lands and Wires has taught me so much through their community challenges. Came to my school to co-present with me and also gave me gloves and biodegradable bags for cleanups. And Abby Zoo worked with me to adopt the care of turtle ambassadors and helps me set up funding for future zoo camp scholarships and school outreach in order to teach about conservation. At Nahe Marsh, I adopted the care of turtle ambassadors and also funded school outreach for conservation education. They also gave me advice on how to market the straw and pouches and offered me and offered to let me borrow trash, grab you think you for cleanups. Through Instagram contacts, I've I've learned about organizing cleanups, composting, and planning for school gardens. Many people don't realize that there are sustainable alternatives to plastic bags and plastic straws. We plan on showing them some solutions and asking my city to create an ordinance fit to ban plastic bags and plastic straws from restaurants and grocery stores. Remember, it's better to have a hundred people trying than one person being perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I I really love that uh, you guys are working together so well. And I mean, it's hard to imagine that I would have the confidence at 11 years old. Um, First, to just do these projects. Thank you for all the work you're doing. To, um, uh, but also to uh, be able to make a difference in this way, and then to have the confidence to talk about it, and to to, to know that this is going out across the country. I understand you've uh, spoken at a couple of conferences lately. Oh, that you're you've been to several conferences lately, and uh, and that's all pretty exciting. So. Um, we do have a Making Waves Award for you. Um, we've seen a few already. And um, uh, I think uh, you and your mom are going to come down to get it or we're going to deliver it. I haven't been part of that conversation. But uh, uh, just to reveal it for you, this beautiful um, hand-blown glass ball that is your own wave because you've been making waves we are sending a wave to you. And especially uh, if you set that in an in a eastern window or maybe you're more active at sunset, uh, set it in a western window and the sun's shining through that, it's a gorgeous wave. It looks like uh, a great Japanese tidal wave, um, but frozen in glass. Um, so I look forward to seeing you again. And if you haven't seen Nicolina's video, I would highly recommend it. Again, it's on our YouTube channel, the Sun Foundation, IL. And uh, I'm sure we're going to be hearing more from you and your colleagues. If you're out there, please give her and her friends another big round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we're going to throw it back to Barry. Barry's got another song for us. What do you have? Oh, this is one that I wrote uh, up near Ottawa, Illinois. Gazing out at the beautiful Illinois River, watching the, watching the fall wake up. It's called Morning's Coming on Illinois. First breath of daylight touched my mind. Blue by the Soul River. Since I was a boy Morning's coming on the Illinois 
And autumn ghosts are dancing in the mist Speaking words that I can't understand They'll volunteer their secrets If I just don't resist Autumn ghosts are dancing in the mist And the years spin by like that paddle wheel Weight of age is dragging on sometimes Whistle blows the dust away The sound of steel on, on steel Years spin by like that paddle wheel There's a wild coyote singing up the sun. Raven moon has dimmed her fading glow. Daylight plays out slowly. Another circle has begun. Wild coyote singing up the sun. And morning's coming on the hill and north. First breath of daylight touched my mind. I've been pulled by the soul river ever since I was a boy. Morning's coming on the hill and north. Oh, morning's coming on the hill and north. Oh, morning's coming on the hill and Thank you again, Barry. That is another one of my favorite songs. Barry and I have worked together on the Illinois River for like 20 years or so, and so there's a lot of river music there. The river is a river of music, a river of songs. Um, gosh, I really enjoy that. Uh, so glad that he could be with us today. Uh, and thank you again to Nicolina and her classmates. Uh, there's so many incredible people doing incredible things. The whole reason we built this platform, our Clean Water Champions uh, mini documentary series, is so we can celebrate people like you who are making a difference in your life. You too can be a Clean Water Champion. And most of the videos we're showing you today are actually tied to games that are on the interactive platform that we built with Interactiva and sponsored by Illinois American Water. Now, for me personally, it is important that we make a difference in our backyard. Uh, but I want to turn that old phrase, uh, think uh, globally and act locally, um, I want to turn it on its head. I think we should think and act globally. We should uh, think locally and act globally. What are things we can do in our backyard that impact the planet? What can we do with the really big goals of changing the way we are involved with the world? As I said earlier, it's our own delusion when we think we're disconnected. Think about one drop of water, and it looks like it is going to rain here. Hopefully it'll hold off until we're done because we have all these electronics outside. And, and all day long I've been sitting here with these beautiful bluebells over my shoulder. The Virginia bluebell is really one of my favorite flowers. They're just so gorgeous. And to think about how the rain impacts those flowers and how the rain falling on your house you can create um, little rain gardens. So instead of running that water off, uh, gutter and curb, gutter and curb is the way a lot of cities think, um, then that creates erosion downstream. 
you can collect that water in a rain barrel and water your wildflowers. But the city also has to make a difference. If you and I in our house and our neighborhood make a difference, it helps. But we need those big picture. We need that big team. And so our next video is one of my new heroes. Uh, Darren Graves works with the city of Peoria. They're doing storm, storm water management um, by creating these wonderful swells and swales. So when they redid this recent highway, and it collects a lot of rainwater because pavement is imperviable, meaning the water doesn't soak in, it runs off. What do you do with that rain rainwater? If you gutter and curb, run it down into the drain stormwater system, it creates flooding downstream. It creates erosion downstream. But if you can create a swell that will absorb that water, it actually is filtered by the native plants and adds to the groundwater which most of us are drinking is groundwater. Wouldn't you rather have it be filtered by Mother Nature? Darren has done this wonderful project that also is good for birds and bird migration, also great for monarchs. This next video ties together several of the things we've been talking about. So let's hear what Darren Graves, who's been working on the MacArthur Highway Project, has to say. Hi, my name is Darren Graves. I work for the city of Peoria. I'm the uh, landscape crew supervisor of Peoria Corps, and I basically maintain most of the city's green infrastructure and landscape all throughout the entire city of Peoria. So this MacArthur Bioswell came ab about with uh, the reconstruction of the highway bridge here, MacArthur Bridge, and it was to collect any stormwater coming off of the bridge and it needed a place to store it. These Bioswells are actually kind of like retention ponds or more so de detention ponds. They hold water for a short amount of time and then sink in the ground. And when you have a water storage area, you want to have plant material that will also soak up that water. And so everything here is uh, native to Illinois, native to our climate, and uh, also is a feeder for all the pollinators that we want to try and bring back to the areas as monarchs and bees and birds and things of that nature. Most of the plant material that you would see in a native garden, if it is only about a foot tall, chances are the root system goes in the ground at least five to six feet. If it's about maybe five foot tall, then you're looking at about five to 10 feet in the ground. So what that means is it doesn't have to be watered as often. It basically draws the moisture and water out of the ground. Natives, once, once you put them in the ground, they're happy, you go about your day. Uh, but what we're trying to focus on was anything that would actually attract a lot of bees and, and butterflies and moss and songbirds and all that, while also producing a lot of color throughout the year from the early spring months all the way into the fall and um, easily maintain. They'll spread over time and, and take over um, the bioswell itself. So whenever it rains, it will soak up that water and release it slowly while, while also uh, cleaning the water before it goes back into the uh, ground. So it was, um, it, it, was, it was a great process to work through with the engineers and through the public trying to find this balance of plant material that was native in Illinois, but also had some characteristic for the south side of Peoria. We need to have a diversity of plants and gardens throughout the entire city to make it one big community. Everyone needs to do their part and the world be a better place uh, as an end result. So now you see why Darren Graves is my new hero. Uh, I, he's like uh, if Barack Obama were a cowboy and a, and a street maintenance guy. I mean, uh, with depth of knowledge about science um, and doing the hard work and working with the volunteers to help plant those swells. Um, I'm really impressed with this project. I was actually a keynote speaker at the International Nonpoint Source Pollution Conference many years ago. And the entire city of Toronto is doing those kinds of things. And if more of our urban neighborhoods paid attention to their water runoff, 
it would make such a huge difference. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, somebody's throwing me signals I don't understand. <laughs> Part of live television. Oh, yeah, rowing down the river. Oh, so um, we, we have a few extra minutes here. Um, we're going we're gonna to throw to another video. When we, I, I was hesitant to show, but my producer is saying it's his favorite video. You might recognize this guy, and I think he tells this story well enough on his own. So uh, I hope you enjoy this next short video. Hi, my name is Brian Fox Ellis, and I love messing around in boats. There's no other place I'd rather be than in a canoe or a kayak on the Illinois River the Mississippi River, the Wabash River, the Spoon River, you name a river, I've probably been there. But I joined the Illinois River Road Tourism Board a couple years ago because I had two projects I could not do on my own. But working with a wonderful team with the Illinois River Road Tourism Board and a dozen communities up and down the Illinois River, I helped to create, well, I instigated and created the Illinois River Road Canoe Trail. It's basically a blue trail. And if you look at a map of your region, you might find some of these blue trails. It's a place where you can get out on the water. Here, we put up a series of signs and benches at places where it's very easy to access the river. I worked with the uh, United Sportsmen's Alliance, a group of apprentice carpenters. I helped to design the benches so they're flood resistant. And it's been really cool because I've watched them flood and I always come back a little nervous and after the flood waters recede, the bench is still there. So we put up the benches and the signs, mainly just as a guidepost to say, hey, this is a great place to get out on the water. Bring your canoe, bring your kayak, bring your friends. And I promise you, if you spend a day paddling on this beautiful river or any river, you'll fall in love with the river. And because you fall in love with the river, you will become compassionate and you will be motivated to do something to make the river a cleaner place. And I promise, if you get out on a boat, get out on the river, you will fall in love with the river and you'll become an activist. You'll do what you can to protect that river, not just for your own recreation, which is reason enough, but for the health of the river for the fish and the birds and the, the eagles, the hawks, the osprey, the uh, largemouth bass, the walleye, the northern pike, for all of the life that depends on the river. For the river itself is life. So check out the Illinois River Road Tourism Board website to learn more about canoeing and kayaking the Illinois River. Or check out your local blue trail wherever you live. And if there isn't one, you could help to create it. You could pull together a team and put up some signs, invite people out to spend a beautiful day on a beautiful river. And you too could be a clean water champion. Part of the success of this project was that we were able to build an incredible team with the American Water Charitable Foundation and funding from Illinois American Water, the Union Sportsman Alliance actually building the benches, and the Illinois River Road Tourism Board helping us to map it out. And it really is all about collaboration and building teams to get things done. And one of the collaborators on the Illinois River Canoe Trail, one of the major sponsors of the Clean Water Celebration, I'm so thrilled to have Karen Cotton representing Illinois American Water. Now you've been involved in this organization for a long time. When you first got involved, what most intrigued you? Why do you think this work is important? You know, I've, I've been involved for 15 years, but it started long before me. You know, uh, there was a lot of folks laying the groundwork and the foundation at Illinois American Water with the Sun Foundation. So what really captured my attention was the enthusiasm and all of the collaboration and everyone cares. We do have a great committee and so thrilled to have you on that committee because our committee meetings are a lot of fun <laughs> because we know we're making a difference right. and, and we each bring something different uh, to the table. Um, why do you think Illinois American Water has chosen uh, the Sun Foundation Clean Water Celebration um, to, to be a major sponsor? How does this play into the mission of Illinois American Water? 
Well, you know, tap water delivers so much more than just drinking water. We deliver um, safe drinking water. We deliver public health. We deliver fire protection. We deliver water to businesses and manufacturers. I mean, we're an important key of a lot of recipes in the community. And I think even so, we uh, folks lose sight. You know, sometimes you go turn on the faucet without turning on the light. You don't look at it, which... You know, we take great responsibility in that because we want to provide an incredible product, but we also want to educate our youth so they help protect our water resources so we can continue to do so. So that's really important. We all can be a conservation hero. That's great. You know, I, I, what you just said kind of startled me because I do often get up in the middle of the night to get a drink of water. <laughs> right. And I don't turn on the light because I don't want to be blinded, you know, in the middle of the night because we trust that water from our local water supplier. Right. and. Uh, the first video we ran this morning was the tour that Pam uh, Ingersoll okay. gave us of your filtration plant, and it really is state of the art. You've made a great investment in the health of our community, um, but also by keeping it clean upstream and helping you know, Sun Foundation make a difference on the river and our Clean Water Champions series as well. Um, I know that you've also sponsored some other really great projects that made a difference, not just on the Illinois River, but throughout the Mississippi watershed. So, uh, in, in your recent memory, what are a couple of the other important projects, like the Boy Scout camp that you guys did? I mean, what else comes to mind? You know, we do a, a lot of projects through our environmental grant program. Um, we've had our environmental grant program since 2009. And we've given over $290,000 to 90 projects. So it's hard to pick a favorite because there's so many. But we partner with folks like up, uh, up north on um, Keep Northern Illinois Beautiful on pharmaceutical disposal programs. And, of course, Paul Ritter with yeah. the Pontiac Township High School on pharmaceutical disposal programs. That's so important. The Illinois River Sweep, the river cleanup efforts. Uh, we partner on projects like that. And then we also partner on projects. Uh, we're launching something at the um, Dunlap School uh, this year on a bioswale that they're working on and there's going to be a water feature and it's going to be an educational water feature so when students can learn at a young age that they have an impact that they're they're what they may perceive as small acts has a global impact then they'll make those small acts in other areas of their lives too and it really is one schoolyard, one backyard, you know, MacArthur Highway. Uh, it's intriguing to see all these swells, uh, swales making a difference. It's like swelling enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would like to talk briefly about this Boy Scout project because I, I, uh, I, I didn't have anything to do with it except that uh, to sing their praises. I gave them a Clean Water uh, Making Waves Award several years ago. But you guys helped to sponsor because, um, you know, there's a lot of silt in the river. And that's, that's, that's a problem for all of us, not a problem that you created, but one that you have to deal with when you're filtering water is, is all that silt, all that mud in the water. And so working with this Boy Scout camp to uh, re-excavate their lake and rebuild their dam, you know, like beaver dams, beaver dams keep the silt out of the creeks that therefore keeps it out of the river. Mm -hmm. And that had a huge impact on the health of the Illinois down in Alton where it empties into the Mississippi mm -hmm. River. I used to pass that filtration facility on a regular basis and I've hiked at that Boy Scout camp. And there are so many ways that, uh, that we can work together, build these kinds of collaborations, do the outreach and education that's necessary to, to change the quality of our water which makes it easier for you to filter, well, which makes it safer for us to drink. And the thing is, is folks may not be aware, but Illinois American Water um, is in 146 communities in Illinois. So Illinois American Water has a lot of different um, touch points uh, mm -hmm. throughout the state, and we have different water treatment plants. Uh, in Peoria, it's a surface water treatment plant, but we also have, you know, the San Cody Aquifer down in Alton. It's the Mississippi River. So, and we're on the, you know, the, the bluff, and it's really important because we want to make sure folks are aware that they can still protect all water sources, um, whether it be uh, underground water or if it's surface water. And it is important to keep in mind that it's all circular, you know, everything mm -hmm. that goes to your tap and out of your house goes back to be treated at the wastewater plant and then back to the environment and then back again to be treated and delivered as drinking yes. water. So we need to do our part to make sure that what is in the river or in the groundwater, um, you know, we'll treat it as needed, but you know, if we can make sure that we can, we don't have to use as, as much treatment in some areas, if that's possible, you know, it's just always plays a difference. And that cycle that you just spoke of actually spirals out to encope 
encompass the globe and time. I love to tell kids in my storytelling programs, the water you drank was inside a dinosaur. There's no doubt about that. It actually takes about 100 years for a drop of water to circle the world, which means 100 years ago, actually 150, the water inside of you was inside Abraham Lincoln or Mary Harriet Tubman. And that same water just keeps going round and round. And thanks to Illinois American Water for making sure what goes into us is much cleaner and safer. But also thank you for the environmental grant program program that helps to fund our event and lots of other great projects as well. Well, it go back, goes back to that word that you used at the beginning, collaboration. We know that we can only do so much on our own. Yeah. So if we can work with folks like you, it, it makes a difference. It's about uh, building community. Um, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for all the work that you and, and your organization has done. We got to talk to Tripp a little bit earlier. Oh, he's fantastic. He is great. Yeah. Uh, we have a good team. Yeah. I love his job title. I want that job. I want to be a nerd herder. Because <laughs> I like working with nerds. I am a science nerd. And, and herding nerds. So we're all working, collaborating together, moving in the same direction. Um, we're going to throw it back to Barry for, for one last song. Uh, Barry Cloyd, what do you got for us? Oh, I was just going to play a little banjo for you. There you go. Right. Great. Nothing like a banjo to make you think about the river. Another one of our good friends and a regular presenter at the Clean Water Celebration is storyteller, musician, drummer, poet from Just Us Arts. Uh, let's hear what Oba William King has to say. I was born in Greenville, South Carolina, raised up in San Bernardino, California. I live in Chicago, Illinois. I am a storyteller. The name Oba comes from the water. I heard the sound of the waves rushing back and forth. Oh. that song together. Y'all ready? She's going to say the words and you say them back. You see, this is how we engage you in the African style of storytelling known as call and response. So you hear the words, you say them, you come back. We come from the water. We come from the water. Living in the water. Living in the water. Go back to the water. Go back to the water. Turn the world around. Turn the world around. See, very good. Now you're going to have a little bit of movement in your shoulders and your arms. How are your shoulders and your arms? Are they feeling good? Very good. I want the dancer to come to teach you the movement. It's like chair dance. So you'll have your bottom in your chair, right. and your arms are going to be moving around. <laughs> it's going to be good. You're singing. We and come from coming. the water. <laughs> Living in the water. Go back to the water. Turn the world around. Let's 
do it again. Oh, yeah, yeah, because what's happening is, like, so some people are going like, she's going, we come, and she's all beautiful and everything, and you're like, oh, I can't sing that pretty. So you're going like, don't worry about singing pretty. Sing like me. I'm going to be with y'all. It's going to be nice. Try. We come from the water. We come from the water. Living in the water. Living in the water. Go back to the water. Go back to the water. Turn the world around. Turn the world around. We come from the water. We come from the water. Living in the water. Living We are all in one. We are all connected. Yay, Bo! Yay, In a small village of Palidaho, in the wonderful country of Benin, West Africa, there is the water bearer. The water bearer who is responsible for bringing fresh, cold, clean drinking water to the village. Each morning, the water barrel would rise early in the morning, take a long pole, which she'd place across her shoulders. At either end of that long pole, she would place two gourds. She placed those gourds at the end of the pole and began to walk the long distance all the way to the watering hole. She'd make her way to the watering hole where she would dip down, fill up one of the gourds, dip, fill the other gourd, rise back up, and began her trek back to the village. When she arrived in the village, she'd take that water and distribute it to the people. Because sometimes you need water for cooking, you need water for cleaning. You need water for washing. You need water for drinking. Sometimes you just need water. After distributing the water to the people, she went to put away that long pole and place those gourds back on the shelf where they sit, where they stay. She heard the sound, whimpering crying, a very slight sound, but she could hear it. She looked about to see where was the sound coming from. She didn't know where it was coming from, but she could hear some kind of little crying. Somebody was hurt. Who is crying? Why do you cry? She looked at the little tiny gourd, answered it as I am crying. I'm crying because I have a hole in my side. And every time you make your way to the watering hole, you fill me up with water. But because of the hole in my side, I am leaking. And by the time we get back to the village, I have already leaked more than half of my water. I am no good. I am broken. I don't work. The little girl was sad. The water bearer began to laugh. It was a beautiful laugh. She laughed and said, on the morrow, when we make our way to the watering hole, I want you to look on the side of the road. Coming back from the watering hole, I want you to look again. Look on the side of the road. And remember what you see, then tell me later. The next day, just like always, she rose up early and she grabbed that long pole, placed it on her shoulder. On either end of the long pole, she placed two gourds. And then she began her trek to the walking hole. Oh, the little daddy gourd was looking on the side of the road. She made her way to the watering hole. Once there's a watering hole, she 
dipped out, filled up one of the gourds. Dipped out, filled up the other one of the gourds. Balanced the pole which carried the gourds and made her way back to the village. When she got to the village, she distributed the water as she always does. Because sometimes you need water for drinking, you need water for washing, water for cooking. Sometimes you just need water. When she distributed the water to all of the people, she went like she always does, to put the gourds away. She looked at that little gourd. She said, hey now, what do you see? Did you look on the side of the road? When we traveled to the watering hole, I did. What did you see? On the way to the watering hole, I saw nothing. Just dirt and rocks, some trash the children had thrown down. I, I wish they wouldn't do that. But coming back, I saw grass. I saw grass and flowers. I saw grass and flowers and trees. I saw grass and flowers and trees and animals running about. It is because of you, said the walk. It is because of you, said the water bearer to the little gourd. Because of me, because of you. I knew you had a hole in your side. So on the way to the watering hole, I planted seed. I dropped seed along the road. Coming back, because of the hole in your side, you leave, thereby feeding the seed, allowing it to grab root, and the grass will grow, the flowers will blossom, the trees will grow, and the animals come. Look around the village. And the little gourd began to look around, and everywhere she looked, she saw green grass. Flowers blooming, trees growing, bearing fruit. Because of me? Ah, uh, you see, each of us are just like that little gourd. We have some flaws. Things might be wrong with us. I wish my ears were not so big, but they are. They are my ears, and I love them. I love my ears. Just like you may see something that you don't like about yourself. That is not what we concentrate on. You find your gift. Each of us are here with a purpose. We have a theme that we must accomplish. Find your gift and spend your life using your gift to make the world a better place. What a great day this has been. What a great morning. Thank you to all of our guests. Thank you, Oba, for that wonderful story, and Just Us Ars for the drumming and the dancing. That was actually one of the keynotes uh, several years ago that Oba and I put together. It was actually spawned at a dinner conversation after uh, we had wrapped up uh, the program one year. We always go out to dinner, and uh, we were saying, we should do something that celebrates the world of water. So I invited a good friend of mine, Ann Shimajina, a Japanese storyteller who told a story about a great wave, and Joe Lakota and the Eagle Ridge drum did a story about the creation of the world and, and uh, the creation of Earth from the depths of the ocean. I did an Irish story um, and Oba, an African story. 
um, stories from around the world. That's what we're all about, celebrating our connection to the world. Because, as I said moments ago, the water inside of you has circled the globe. The glass of water that you're drinking today um, could have been in the Rocky Mountains a few weeks ago and flowed downstream, could have been in a whale in the Pacific Ocean a few months ago and then evaporated and came down as rain or snow. Mm. And I love these bluebells. Can you, I can't get over them. You know, they are in a little swell here. If you look at the topography, the lay of the land, the geography, um, where water runs down, Additional water means additional flowers. It's intriguing how much of the hillside is still brown. But because of the water running down into the swell, it, it provides the moisture for these bluebells to thrive. Much like that swell that Darren Graves created at the foot of MacArthur uh, Highway and the bridge there. You could add to that swell. You could be a clean water champion. Maybe you already are. And if you're doing some great stuff in your community, let us know about it. We'd love to sing your praises. We'd love to give you a Making Waves Award. Maybe you could write a song. Maybe you could produce a video. Maybe you could go out and do some streamside monitoring, collect some bugs, and the bugs will tell you how clean the water is, like Karen Zuckerman and her students did. There are so many opportunities to make a difference. Monitor bird populations, help with bird banding, or like those students out in California, create a mini climate makeover in your neighborhood. So many ways that we have and continue to make a difference. I would like there to be clean water for my children and grandchildren. Matter of fact, when we're done here, I'm going to go hang out with my grandbabies, and I want to give them a world that was better than the world that I inherited from my ancestors. You can do that. Together, build a team, create collaboration. Check out our video game. There's some really fun activities in there. Uh, go to the Sun Foundation's website to uh, link to the Clean Water Champion videos and the interactive platform. And hopefully, be inspired. Share that inspiration so you can be a Clean Water Champion. One more time, I want to thank our sponsors. We couldn't do it without the folks who volunteer to be on the committee, who come to committee meetings, the teachers who work with their students, uh, the, the outreach education, all of the folks who help put together this wonderful event. We'll see you next year at the Peoria Civic Center, April 23rd in 2023, live in person. But let's go out with one more shout out to our sponsors. Tranquility, majesty, peace through understanding of that giant old river running through my hometown. Standing on the bank, lost in the distance, imagining the future with the past flowing down. Can you see her in the light of a bright spring morning? Is she hidden in the shadow? Of warm October's past Is the moonlight on the water Reflecting your passion What are we gonna do to make it last? Wrap your loving arms around the heart of that river Pass along our stories that you've heard for so long Take a stand from Mother Nature and her hypnotizing waters sing that river song can you see her in the light of a bright spring morning is she hidden in the shadows of warm october's past is the moonlight on the water reflecting your passion what we're gonna do to make it last Tranquility, majesty, peace through understanding of that giant old river running through my hometown. Standing on the bank, lost in 
the distance, imagining the future with the past flowing down, imagining.